welcome. Uh, so they'll be calling their meet meeting to order a little bit later, but we've got a few items that we need to take care of first. So the first item is to review and approve the agenda. Uh, and I think there are probably no changes from what was advertised. So uh, yes? Except what I just mentioned to you. Uh, except for that, we can do we can deal with that. Okay. When it comes At up. That time. Okay. Okay. So, um, without objection, we're going to consider the uh, agenda approved. Uh, general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on some matter that is otherwise not on our agenda. And if you uh, would like to say something, if you would try to keep your comments to about two minutes, that would be great. Public. <laughs> uh, I would like the Montpelier City Council to especially take notice of the pro a problem I discovered this week. I reviewed the meeting of the Design Review Board on video, and I confirmed that indeed our City Planning Director uh, informed the Design Review Board that the finished garage was 37 or 39 feet tall as a way to dispute whether or not we needed to do the balloon test. The, dra the drawings clearly state that it's a 54-foot garage, 54 feet 4 inches. And then when I wrote to Meredith, our zoning administrator, to ask to that correction be made to inform the design review's deliberations, I was told that process is closed. Do not write them, and we cannot pass them any more information. Mm. So you got a real problem created by your own city staff that misinformed a critical decision on the design review permit process for that garage. So I don't know how you're going to handle it, but I'm also informed that the city didn't comply with separation of the building in pushing for approval of Article 1, that there was lobbying within the building, the voting area, uh, that is prohibited by... I'll let you investigate that, too. Thank you. And also, could you say your name? That's why you And where Montpelier. you live. Whitaker, Montpelier. Great. Thank you. We'll look into it. Sam Dworkin in Montpelier. Uh, I just wanted to, one, thank the city for its work it did with how icy it was the last couple of days. Um, that's very good. But also to ask the city council to do what it can to encourage folks to pay attention to winter tar parking bans and such so that particularly folks who have difficulty getting in and out of buildings or vehicles um, are still able to get around, especially when it gets icy or snowy. If uh, people could just make an extra special care to not be taking up those spaces that people with less physical ability may need. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, moving on. The consideration of the consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve or remove anything? Move to, approve, to remove item D, proposed settlement of property tax appeal. Is there a motion for the rest of it? I move to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item D. I'll second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Um, should we d deal with D right now? Um, I'm happy to deal with it now. I'm happy to deal with it uh, later in the agenda after all the people who aren't, who are only here because they have to be here. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> okay. Well, let's do that. We'll take that up at the end. So um, it's going to be a long <coughs> discussion, Jack? <laughs> I, I don't think so, but I don't know. Okay. Okay, so we have some appointments to make uh, to the Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee, and I believe there were five seats and four applicants. Um, are any of the applicants here and would like to introduce themselves? Yes? I think there was a string of emails today about all the reasons why people couldn't attend, but okay. they're all interested. And there was a fairly lengthy one from Heather, uh, really talking about the viability of what the Transportation Infrastructure Committee does and how much she f wants to be part of it. Great. So, uh, anyone here from the MTIC? No? Okay. Uh, what is your pleasure, Council? I move that without going into executive session, we appoint all the applicants. I'll second. Further discussion? Do we need to have particular uh, terms for any of these applicants? Nope. I don't think I was, no. Thank you. That's a great question. Okay, we have a motion. 
did, and it was seconded, yeah? So, okay, further discussion? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Uh, and then the Complete Streets Group, the Name the Path contest. Um, I assume uh, either Gary or Jamie or someone is coming up to tell us about this. Uh, thank you. My name's uh, Gary Holloway. I'm the chair of the Complete Streets Group. John Snell. I'm the Complete Streets Group. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for having me. I was I was expecting to be here um, later in the agenda. I didn't realize it would go so quickly. So this is this is terrific. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so thanks for uh, thanks for giving us a moment here uh, on the agenda. Uh, back in uh, back this summer, the uh, the Complete Streets Group, um, with, who advocates for um, kind of awareness and education and safety around uh, alternative transportation for the city, uh, took it upon ourselves to uh, to have a contest to name the path that runs along the Winooski River. You mean um, the bike path? Uh, the bike path, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Shared. Uh, so we, so we uh, you know, we, we recognize that uh, the bike, bike path uh, was really used by uh, many forms of transportation and wanted to kind of educate the public around uh, the use of the path for all modes, but also to kind of select a name that we could be, you know, proud of and that we could use, um, you know, and learn and know, uh, recognizing that really no one really knows what the name of that path is. Um, so, especially in light of it being expanded very soon. Right. Right. So as, as, as you know, as you all know, we're going to be expanding the path from, uh, from Stonecutter's Way out to Gallison Hill Road and then have it run all the way out to, towards Dog River Park there. Uh, so we, we had a contest uh, that ran from essentially uh, 4th of July through Labor Day. Uh, we received over 200 name submissions, so I, I thank the public for engaging in our, uh, in our contest. Uh, there was a lot of terrific suggestions, uh, some honoring, you know, those who contributed to the trail. Um, you know, a lot of John Snell recommendations to name the trail, trail after him, uh, <laughs> as well as others who contributed to the path. Uh, but in the end, we, we narrowed it down, uh, and it was interesting. I don't know that we, we thought we were going to go down this path no. um, in, selecting, in selecting the name that we did. Uh, but in the end, you know, we, we felt it was important to kind of honor the, uh, honor the river, honor the path, honor the water, uh, and the connections to their cultural past. And so we selected the name Sibawinabi uh, Path, uh, which means river water. Uh, and this was a name that, was, uh, that we... Um, chose from um, our very own Jamie Granfield, um, who's here in the audience. So thank you for, for taking us down that path. But before we chose this name, we thought it was important that we, we uh, approach the Abenaki um, Council and ask them permission uh, to make sure that this was the right use of the name, uh, the right pronunciation and meaning. Uh, and they were very pleased um, that we uh, were giving consideration to um, you know, to their tribe um, and, and, and the fact that they've, you know, they settled in this area, you know, long before we walked the path along the river. Uh, so I'd like to read a, um, a quote um, that we're going to include in the press release, but I um, thought you would enjoy hearing uh, what Chief St D Donald Stevens said um, regarding this. Uh, it is refreshing that people in Vermont want to acknowledge and celebrate the Abenaki people as the original Vermonters by using our language to identify various places. Partnerships like these are to be cherished and bring hope that our children will have a future path where all can be accepted and proud of their heritage. Education is the only way to bring about lasting change, and this is certainly a step on that path. Uh, I, just a couple other things I want to I just mention uh, in terms of opportunities and using this path. Uh, one is we, we talked about uh, maybe our next step uh, and looking at um, um, some signposts similar to what was installed in Hubbard Park uh, that we might be able to identify and locations along the path pointing to, um, to different things. Uh, we also thought there might be an opportun opportunity either in existing parks such as Peace Park or maybe the Confluence Park where we could um, put up a little bit more information about uh, the meaning of this, um, of, of Sibo Wienabee, 
um, or the Abenaki or other settlers, you know, along the Winooski and Montpelier. Uh, and then uh, we plan we're planning to have a ribbon cutting and a little bit more of a formal ceremony where we can uh, be inclusive of um, those that were involved, uh, including the Abenaki tribe, maybe in the spring or summer when it's a little bit warmer. And Jamie. And Jamie. <laughs> so, Yay, Jamie. Uh, so anyway, I just want to uh, share with council, this, was, this is our recommendation um, to, um, to select this name. And thank you, uh, Jamie Granfield, for yeah. proposing this thought and taking us down there. Uh, yeah, Donna. As long as I don't have to pronounce it. And you are going to have to record this on the city website. Well, you know, that was one of the things <laughs> that I struggled with initially. And we realized that it's not that big a deal once you have it in front of you and repeat it a few times. And that it's really important for us to, to take that in and, and really have it be a part of that river and our walking along it. So... We'll take care of you and me both. <laughs> <laughs> I'm phonically deaf, so good luck. Good. But I would like to make a motion yep. that the council accept this recommendation for the name of the path right. that runs all the way along the Minuski River. Thank you. Right. I'll second that. Further discussion? Uh, I guess I, before we vote, I just want to say thank you to you and the, the committee for running this competition and uh, to all the people who submitted suggestions. And um, I'm just really excited for the bike path to be, to be done. And then, you know, we can, be, we can be talking about it and know how to refer to it. So it's great. Yes. Um, I just wanted to mention that I, as I've been talking to friends around town about this extended path, a lot of folks who I generally think of as, you know, pretty well keyed into to what's <coughs> going on in Montpelier were totally unaware that we were extending the path out to Gallison Hill Road. So I'm hoping we can get your help, um, you know, as we announce the, the name and, you know, as the path is built um, to promote it a little bit more. Um, and I think it's a really exciting thing and I want everyone to know about it. Great. So, um, further discussion? Right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so that brings us up to the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Lucas. For sure. So, uh, just for our record, it is 645, and I'll call the meeting of the City of Barrie Council to order. Uh, we do have a quorum. Um, it is being recorded. Uh, Carol will be watching the video to Carol's take. Here. Oh, Carol is here. <laughs> she sent me a message earlier. I didn't know she'd be making it. Um, and we do have a quorum. Uh, Councilor Booten is walking this way. We have Councilor Batham. We have Councilor Higby and Councilor LePage. So thank you. And I'll turn it back over to you. Oh, OK. Well, and I'm just going to um, invite the CDPSA to uh, <coughs> come and give us a, an update. Why you come up here? <laughs> I have one actually. Thank you. I have the whole thing. I the PowerPoint presentation as well. Oh, maybe I will take one. Thank you. We have a brief. Let me, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming here. Okay. I, if anything, having both city councils together is a success for CBPSA. <laughs> 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 I just want to start the video. Thank you all for coming. Can I know, we win? You know, we, we keep coming to you every year. We keep slightly changing it a little bit, but I think the message has relatively stayed the same. Um, but we've tried to flesh out a lot of uh, the questions that came up over last December when we met Dick Fire. Sorry, I, before you get too deep in, it might make some sense here. Um, you were just introducing some um, people from your council, and I think it might make sense for us to just go one more time. Just everybody say your names as we go around, and then and then uh, even down. Uh, uh, with CVPSA folks as well. So if we could start over there, if you would just say your name. Yeah. Michael Booten. Okay. I'm sorry. Michael Booten. Rosie Kruger. Jack McCullough. Brandon Batham. Lucas Herring. Ann Watson. John Odom. Sarah Whitney. Glenn Hutchison. Big Bad John LePage. <laughs> Connor Casey. Donna Bate. Uh, Tom Galanka. CBPSA. Paco Walmond. Tim Cheney. Sam Dworkin. Martin Prevo. Great. Sorry. You were saying. Okay. So I have a slight, a small, a short presentation, which I was going to go basically just to summarize what um, we've done over the past year and also to set some parameters for newer council members to so understand what we've been doing. working towards over the past uh, uh, couple months, as well as to sort of frame tonight's discussion. You know, ultimately, 
we're looking for guidance in regards to what the step forward is. Um, we haven't generated any type of specific budget request for this year um, pending this discussion. You know, it could be as little as nothing to as much as whatever you want us to put on to utilize the Central Mount Public Safety Authority fr uh, structure or framework. Um, I do want to start by just thanking the commitment of both the cities of Barrie and Montpelier in this effort. You know, regionalization is never easy. Um, change is never easy. Um, we've tried to take the perspective of what will improve public safety and also try to take it from a position of strength where it's not broken, where we haven't had a significant failure or we haven't had any type of uh, uh, problem with the current system. So I think it's it's from this vein of thought we've tried to put together a plan that we view as a possible step forward, possibly with alternatives or, or, or changes from the different cities. But we think it would be a good exercise to go through this and go through the process of what we've looked at over the past year and to thank the board for their commitment over this period and to thank the, the communities for supporting us. Um, I have this presentation. It's up on my screen. I don't know. I don't see it up there. Is there anything, John, I need to do? Turned that off earlier. When it was. <clears throat> and everyone should have a copy of this, so I'm not going to read it all completely, but I think I'll just go to highlights. And what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Paco to um, get in any more specifics or to answer any specific questions you have and uh, hopefully start the conversation uh, up from last December. Takes a couple minutes. <laughs> Usually this happens perfectly without it. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. There we go. Thanks, John. So I figured I'd start tonight's discussion to kind of review what was asked of us last December and what we asked the voters back in March to approve for our um, effort for this upcoming fiscal year. And um, the first item was really to uh, encourage and include an additional member and particularly to look at the Capital Fire West structure and see if there's a way to integrate that into the CVPSA model. Um, we also wanted to come up with a plan that we could recommend to these councils, um, review a potential budget with some of our assumptions, re review the simulcast digital upgrade um, project that Capital S has currently looked at. So we wanted to have some sort of um, idea of a timeline and implementation plan for that. Uh, we were asked by council members to incorporate community and staff recommendations in public safety. We think, we feel we've done that with numerous meetings and we'll enumerate a lot of those um, over the next uh, uh, couple minutes. And we also wanted to identify the role of the CVPSA in any future governance or public safety and to sort of get some feedback in regards to what it could be used for in the future. So basically to summarize in regards to the first item in regards to getting a number member, I do want to announce that we were successful in, in obtaining a positive vote for the Capital Fire Mutual Aid System to join us um, as an active board member in the process. Um, they just started participating in our board function back in September. Um, as a reminder, this body's contract up with Montpelier is up in two years, so I think it's integral to have them at the table, to have them working with us in any of these solutions. Um, they also are uh, integral in the uh, decision making in regards to the simulcast digital upgrade process. So having them at the table I think is a significant step forward. It, it positions us to really um, you know, help Montpelier and Barry really identify some of the um, infrastructure needs over um, the next couple of years. Um, what we are asked to obviously is prepare uh, and recommend a plan for the future of dispatch operations as our first entity. Um, under advisement. And, and I wanted to clarify these four sort of things that we wanted to include into our plans. Uh, one, we felt that it had to be, in our opinion, in the best interest of Central Vermont, not just Barry, not just Montpelier, all communities in this area. Um, we, we wanted it, and uh, the chiefs uh, insisted on that a plan to show improvement from both of the situations would have two people, two, dispatcher, two dispatchers on at all times. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
Um, right now, you do have gaps in both cities, and each city really, I don't think, has the ability to have two dispatchers on at all times. And we feel that's an integral safety um, uh, goal that we would like to prove in our plan. Um, we also were committed to coming up with a plan to improve technology. We think a lot of the technological technological problems could cause significant problems, particularly if you were to add on any new contracted members with extra revenue. Uh, we think you're at capacity at this level, but extra technology would help improve that and, and could potentially offer significant uh, revenue opportunities. Um, we were also committed to recommend a plan that allowed for this expansion as well as allowed for potential shared savings, whether through grant writing opportunities or whether through uh, purchasing opportunities. Um, the CAD system being a primary example, um, by using it through CVPSA, you really only need one license uh, instead of two. And so at a price tag of $125,000 a pop, you can see how those savings can add up. Just in this one project, if you look at others down the road, you could have significant savings. Um, what we've come up with as a transitional plan, and, and ultimately uh, we feel having dispatchers work together is the best solution. And so our recommendation from the CVPSA is to explore a single size dispatch center. Uh, we're, we're indicating that it should be leased in the early years because we figured there really wasn't the appetite to, to purchase a building. The, the bond costs of that would be um, too um, extraordinary. Long term, we would like to see an own facility, but we figured based in Berlin would offer the best opportunity for both communities as well as our contracted towns. Um, obviously the benefits which we've listed before, um, I won't list all of them, but um, I've said some before, the technology, the grant opportunities, coordination of resources, um, I think are tremendous opportunities for, for all involved. Looking at the budget, now I want to explain this a little bit um, because we wanted to compare apples to apples. Um, right now, you aren't paying for a CAD. We assume in this budget model that both Barry and Montpelier will have to assume CAD implementation in their models at some point. We put it in year one just to compare apples to apples because our recommended plan is that CAD will be an integral part in our budget process. So if you notice, year 2020 has a leap, but it's the capital leap. It's not the operating leap. Um, and if you, can, if you can see in that graph, um, the CVPSA model is slightly below in all categories. Um, and mainly that's uh, generated through um, operational efficiencies as well as some overtime savings. And Paco will go into <laughs> that in more detail and explain some of the um, uh, estimates he's used in that model. So just as a point of how we're going to go through this, do you want questions at the end or do you want questions along the way? Why don't we have questions at the end because then Paco can get more, if you have more specific uh, detail work in regards to the proposal, he can break these down. But I just wanted to give a big overview um, for mainly for the public as well as the council as a whole in one, one shot. Um, these are the assumptions we made, uh, five-year combined savings of $271,000. The CAD system upgrade was, is assumed in all projections, and that's $125,000 per contract. Um, we list an excess capacity, which we don't include in these models. Uh, one of the questions from Mayor Lawson a, a year ago or two years ago was that he wanted to see, well, what's the opportunity for expansion? Um, right now, you're at a cap at both towns. It would be very you'd, you'd have limited capability to add extra revenue. We figured in a single site with two people on at all times and have a more professional staff, uh, we've identified about $600,000 in additional revenue, which could go directly to the bottom line to lower these costs for, for all towns and all members in the plan. Um, what that looks like in terms of a digital upgrade, the next option in regards to here is a digital upgrade. Um, I think one of the slides is missing in this thing that you have. Uh, this is an older version that I have listed. The city savings slide, which we added in, it shows it breaks it down by Barry and Montpelier. You have it in your copy. This one that was uh, downloaded, I must have grabbed an old version. So I apologize for that in advance. Uh, I'll go off this model. Looking at the simulcast digital upgrade, that was another one of the requests that the towns asked us to look into. Um, ultimately, this is a Capital West process, and but it, it's integral in regards to Montpelier's way of providing a single dispatch system. And 
it, it runs upward of a million and a half to two million dollars. And so how do we afford this? And how are we going to, as a community, look to, uh, look to finance such an expensive undertaking? We feel it's essential to review. We're not ready to recommend how we're going to do that. But bringing Capital West into the model, I think, is, is the, a great first step in regards to addressing this issue. Um, we've developed an initial cost model using Capital West model. This is it. Um, we basically took what the cost would be, a $1.6 million bond at 3% over 20 years would cost the towns about $109,000. We plugged in this number into all the member towns in the Capital West network to give us a starting point of what potentially it could look like. We're not saying this is what it's going to cost each of the towns, but I think using their model gives us a really good starting point of how they've already fleshed out the details of what it would, what it would look like. And so you can see it breaks down into um, ranging anywhere from a thousand bucks to you know twenty thousand dollars. But it, if you break it down amongst these uh, twenty towns, it, it, it becomes more easily um, recognizable that this could be attainable and it would benefit the whole community. Um, leading to my last assumption is well, and what we want to get to the meat of tonight is well, what is the role of CVPSA? We we think this is the best direction that both Barry and Montpelier and the outside towns should take. Um, Ultimately, we would like to see CVPSA take a more active role in, in dispatching services. What that means and what time that, that means is to be determined. Um, ultimately, we view staff transitioned as employees of CVPSA. CVPSA. Um, we feel that this coordination of the CAD system and simulcast radio plan will be a significant benefit of utilizing CVPSA, even if you just use this for financing or grant writing capabilities. And we feel debt issuance, um, no one town is going to issue this debt that's potentially needed. We feel you could use this vehicle in regards to debt service. But we're at that point where we can't really do much of anything more unless we have direction from the councils in regards to where you want to go. Is this feasible? Um, should we explore this? Do we need more answers? Do we need benchmarks in regards to when can we move forward? Um, because I don't think any one town can do this individually. Um, and I'll leave us with a quote, you know, basically by John Kennedy. Um, and, and I think it's really apropos to hear, um, you know, change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. The future of dispatching is working together. Montpelier cannot afford to do it alone. Barry cannot afford to do it alone. Um, I think utilizing the benefit of us working together can really benefit all of us. Um, and I think it will provide... 60,000 or so residents of central Vermont with, with something we can be proud of, um, what we can expand on. And you can feel confident in that if you call that 911 number or you call that emergency dispatch, you're going to get an answer. You're not going to have interference. You're going to be able to be confident that you're going to be responded to. And I think if you don't do that, we're going to go down this slippery slope where eventually you're going to come to a place where you're going to be at a situation where it's broken. And I'd hate to come back to this table uh, in a situation where somebody's either had an accident, where the system failed, where the simulcast system doesn't work, and then you're really trying to catch up. And it's going to be a lot more expensive. It's going to probably won't be done as, as thoroughly or thoughtfully. And uh, I think you'll, you'll be uh, remiss not to miss this opportunity. So with that, I'll throw it to Paco to answer any questions or to any other board members who have any comments. I appreciate all the effort and time and meetings we've gone to. I want to thank the staff for all their help and participation in formulating these uh, ideas. Uh, it's always fluid. There's no set in stone right answer, but I think working together will get us to the end point in this mission. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good. So questions. <laughs> yeah, so um, looking at this, uh, the, the five-year budget projection, yeah. this initial uh, 2020 year estimate that you've that you put together, you said assumes capital costs in the overall cost. Is that this uh, this number the the status quo number uh, for 2020? Does that include a, the the tech upgrade that we're talking about here? In it includes the, CAD. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 that is that is an assumption that that these 
to municipalities would. Yeah, we wanted to compare it apples to apples. You know, okay. you can take that off for if you don't do it and Barry doesn't do it, yeah. Yeah. take that $125,000 out. And um, can you speak to the disparity and the, the city savings? What is, what's to account for that jump between 20, uh, fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 21? between the two, uh, for specifically for Barry City, I mean, you see a, a marginal savings in that initial year and then a massive jump. I'm, I'm trying to figure that one out. I'm not, I'm not sure which, which so in your report, chart you're looking at. Are you looking diagram. at this chart? The city savings. City savings. Uh, Why is there no savings in this year versus these here? <laughs> Well, I, I'm less concerned about what, why there wouldn't be as many as much savings in fiscal year 20 as, as much as I am that, like I said, that that disparity between the two years is just a sizable jump. The only the only explanation I have is in fiscal year 20 is where we invest in uh, capital expenditure, an extra hundred and twenty five thousand dollars, and the the cost savings formula was derived from taking 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 uh, the the percentage that Barry City contributes now or would save after you subtract subtract your revenue and factor it into this formula. So the real answer is, lies in the <coughs> capital expense associated in fiscal year 20. So in fiscal year 21, the capital expense goes away and there's a jump uh, in savings for Barry City. I, I'll have others, but... <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about the uh, quote enhanced? Oh, could you talk a little bit about the enhanced grant opportunities that you've described or alluded to? Well, what are the sources, and and why do you see that as being enhanced with with this operation? Oh, well, any grants will will ask who are the members that are applying for the grant, and and I've been informed that you have a better chance of success if you have multiple communities applying for the grant in one package. Um, and so we haven't identified specific ones that are going to pay for this yet, but we anticipate that a application from a what? joint entity would have a better chance of success. That's okay. what I meant by that. When you say specific ones, you mean sources, potential sources of funding. Uh, sources of federal fundings, whether it's federal or if they're state or if there's homeland security grants available. If, if we we don't, we don't have any right now that are on the table, but it would be ones that we would explore through the through our operations. Okay, so you're unit. speculating that there could be yes. some grant opportunities. Yes. Okay, that are enhanced. Enhanced by our application as a group versus Barry versus Montpelier. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Okay, Connor. Would we uh, envision any reduction in force and current public safety staff in either city? It's we were anticipating the utilizing existing staff in, in the capacity with the, the so total number of in terms of who they would come well depending on the structure who signs their paycheck would change depending on cbpsa involvement but the physical people who are answering the dispatch calls the goal from this production would be to keep all of them okay yeah. and, sorry just following up is the uh, fop supportive of this uh, plan They've been active in our, our participation. Caroline's here to represent them, but uh, we, we've actively engaged them in discussion. We, we don't. We, we anticipated that, and we voted as a board that we would not reduce force. That, that was one of our discussions we did have. That we integrate the existing uh, force as is, because we do. We will need them if we're going to have two two people on 24/7. Thanks. So just going off from Connor's question, if you're going to have a different entity being your boss, basically, mm -hmm. uh, that hiring process, are you going to basically uh, slot into a position that you previously held that is looks like your old position? Or is this another hiring process where you have to basically uh, go through that process to keep your job? It's our intent to take the existing employees and slot them into the new jobs to honor their uh, seniority and to develop a pay structure that is fair and equitable. Now, beyond that, I, I don't want to go too deep because there's a collective bargaining process that we have said that we would honor and work, uh, work with them. But the idea is to move the staff uh, and to our uh, best effort honor their existing seniority, their existing benefits, and enhance wherever possible. 
Yeah, and I think that, that gets to my, my next question. In, in, in earlier discussions, there was some talk about a uh, kind of trickle in, in the shift from the, the employees being employed by the municipality and then moving to CVPSA, and then there would be a gradual shift in that. Um, and I was concerned at the time that it seemed at the time, and again, this may have changed as the proposal has changed, um, so I guess maybe my first question should be, are we, are we imagining everybody shifting on the same timetable and everybody's negotiating their contract, you know, together as opposed to what that initial plan had been was, okay, well, we were going to have uh, Montpelier dispatchers move over first and then Barry City dispatchers were going to gradually move in and would likely have uh, shifted over after uh, collective bargaining negotiations would have taken place. So is there, is there still that gradual shift from, from the municipalities as the employers and then CVPSA? Uh, that's, that's really a question that's yet to be uh, nailed down. We don't have a labor management plan, but to answer your question based on what I believe is the plan is, we would work to bring them over uh, at, one, at one time when I say one time, as employees of CBPSA. Now, our plan, if we move forward, is to work to transition the actual dispatching function. We, we plan on cutting Montpelier first, and then uh, a few weeks later, cutting uh, Barry City over. But the staff would be uh, employees of CBPSA. And to the extent that we can do this and work on a collective bargaining agreement, to allow it to officially happen, that's what we want to work towards. Uh, is it fraught with um, hurdles, stones, potholes, in terms of actually figuring out the, the steps? I, I think it is, but our vision would be to, if we get a notice to proceed, would be to start working with uh, uh, the employees and their collective bargaining, in, uh, collective bargaining uh, organization. Uh, we, can't, we can't necessarily assume that it would be the FOP. Uh, we have to let the employees decide that. But um, we would want to start that process as soon as possible to see what the landmines were in terms of making it happen. Ideally, we'd like to pick a cutover date that has a collective bargaining, in pla a bargaining agreement in place and employees starting on day one. So speaking of day one, when would day one be? July 1 of 2019? We, we specifically didn't list a date. We listed days of timeline and rights implementation. I think it's important to, that's a, a difference from last year where we said, well, we want to do it on July 1. We understand that there's steps involved, that there's benchmarks that need to be met, either through Barry or Montpelier. And so our point is to say, this is the plan we'd like to proceed on. If we do, I think it's important for both Barry City and Montpelier to understand this so they can integrate it in their budgets. And if there has to be some type of intermunicipal transfer six months after the fiscal year starts, I think that's, that's doable. But you need to know about this is what we're thinking. So when you go back to your budgeting process over the next couple months, you include it. Because we're not putting this in a CVPSA budget because we don't have that July 1 uh, cutoff date like we have offered in the past. There's too many variables that could back things up. You know, uh, it's not ready. The, the, the negotiations with the uh, unions hasn't been complete. You know, so I, I think the go, no go date would depend on benchmarks and parameters that are set by the chiefs, and we'd be beholden to that. And, and that's what we kind of, why we didn't want to put a set date. In, in, fairness, to, uh, in fairness to explain the board's uh, planning process in mind, if we go back in time, I originally had put together a a uh, Gantt chart of tasks with a timeline that targeted July 1, 2019. Uh, that was predicated on finding a lease, entering into a lease agreement with a facility. It was predicated upon moving staff over. More importantly, it was predicated on a notice to proceed at this time frame and that we would meet all these benchmarks. Uh, I have been told by other people that um, a, best, a best practice is to uh, implement some technologies, the CAD system that you've heard about. There's no way that that would be, could be done, in my opinion, uh, now, based on some things I've heard, by July 1. But our original, my original planning process 
included a July 1, 2019 date if we met all of these benchmark tasks. Um, but the, uh, the board and myself realized that we were probably better off creating uh, uh, months to completion when eliminating the hard dates. So, uh, because you know, do we, will we get uh, notice to proceed, or, we, or when will we get that notice? We don't know. But it's safe to say that the uh, the timelines in terms of days and months in the plan is predicated on us starting the process. Councilor LePage. Um, I'm very, very pleased to hear um, a lot of, uh, in, in the remarks, the muses, the questions about uh, some uncertainties and such. Um, and um, the, the quote that I want to share is from Michelle Rilke, uh, French uh, poet and uh, writer from the turn of the 19th century into the 20th. And that is to value your questions. And we are here to ask questions. And answers are not um, certain at this point. Um, and I haven't seen anyone introduce themselves here tonight as a registered psychic. So obviously, we're not going to have anybody say, this is how it's going to go. Uh, now, I'm not uh, in a position of for or against at this point. But my sort of ponder is, uh, has there been given any thought or any plan, any discussion to assessing this, uh, assuming we have a go-ahead, some sort of consensus that says this is where we're, the, the direction we're moving, that to review uh, uh, projections uh, in comparison to what's actually happening? Has there, has there been any discussion about uh, presenting that in a very um, readable form for average citizens uh, without um, uh, going through the graphs and things. In other words, we, our, our projections were for x, and here we are at 90% of x, something very basic. Has there been any discussion or plan to present that uh, to the public, uh, assuming there's a go forward? That, that, I think that would be a great opportunity to engage the public in regards to getting further information. We just don't need, we need to know from the cities if there is an intent to proceed. And, and from Barry City's perspective, I, I, I see your concerns. Well, what do you do with that space? And, and how much does it cost to keep it? And, and do, we wanna, do you want to hire someone in that space? And is it going to cost you more? We tried not to um, go into the Barry budget or the Montpelier budget for residual costs. That could impact your decision. We just wanted to say what we thought was in the best interest to provide the level of service we think is needed in central Vermont. And from that framework, um, I'd be happy to go, you know, present more simplified slides or benefit analysis of what, what you're going to get better than what you are right now. Um, I think the dispatchers do a great job. I think they're understaffed. Um, I think they're overworked. And I think they don't have the backup that a, that a single site with duplication and career advancement would entail, would allow for them. But I, I don't know how you prove that. Uh, until you actually get into the model, uh, but anyway. Right, right. I was just sort of uh, pondering um, uh, the uh, Public Safety Authority uh, as um, uh, being in a position of issuing a, a self-grading report card, uh, not necessarily that you're going to hold joint meetings, which I think is great to have the Barry City, Montpelier. I don't know, has this ever happened before, Barry City? And, yeah? Yeah. Um, how, how long ago has it been since this happened? Two years. Two years. Two years. Precedes my, I'm one of the greenest, I am the greenest horn on the council here. There is one uh, that's uh, newer than uh, myself on the council. And so it's something I had not seen. And I, I think it's a wonderful thing. It should happen more than just for this issue. Yeah. This is a community. This is not, I mean, there are separate uh, council meetings, separate dates and all that. But Central Vermont is a little bit like this list of towns involved. Yeah. Um, as I read postings on Front Porch Forum, I read all my neighboring ones. And I am so impressed when I see, here's Montpelier with a smaller population than Barrie. And the postings on Front Porch Forum are three to seven times as many as we have in Barrie. There's discussion. It's lively. Be careful and what you wish for. 
<laughs> yeah, we don't like Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> well, I assume I some it. people don't like it if, it if you end up getting your ears burned on it. Um, <laughs> but it, it's an incredibly valuable resource to, to get a pulse. And I, I'm sure it has bickering, but so does the city council meeting. Yeah. And so I'm just sort of wondering if there's a, 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 a real clear intent to issue a self-assessment report card without being complex, without, you know, this is what we projected and this is where we are. That's what I would like to see, a commitment to that. Consolidating anything in Central Vermont is challenging. You know, if you wanted to ask me what our, my self-assessment of CVPSA over the past number of years, I'd probably give us a low grade because we haven't been able to prove what the value would be. We have a lot of these theories and ideas, and a lot of it, in order to get that proof of value, is to actually take the leap and implement them. And it's hard to do. Um, it's hard to ask a council to give up control without having strings attached. And so an entity like CVPSA is great in theory, but until we actually have teeth or ability to influence decisions, we're going to go nowhere. And that's kind of. Some of these sessions, I think, are great, but I'd rather you say, no, we don't want to do it. We want to stay with our Barry model or our Montpelier model, or yes, go ahead. It's this middle ground that is, is, is very difficult. Frustrating. It's very frustrating. So I'd give us a low grade, but I, you know, maybe I'm Well, I thank you for your candor. But, um, hang on. I, I think we have a, a line here. Yeah. Uh, so we could go to Glenn. Uh, yeah, Glenn, I think, okay. was Glenn. next, then Sue, then Donna. This may be brief. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm curious about the, you mentioned uh, something like uh, 600,000 new possible revenue. Can you go into some detail on that? Yes, it is on page six of the report. Um, if you look in it, now part of it, Tony will probably, he's in back there, he'll yell at me, <laughs> Get, getting in a PSAP, and I don't think Tony wants to do that, but it identifies new Unidentified town. It identifies Barry Town, Police Department, Fire Down, Medical, and it lists the dollar amounts. Um, and then it lists Berlin. Um, ultimately, there's also state potential revenue. So it's broken down in fiscal 21, 22, 23, 24, and you can see how it, it gradually increases. Um, that number is minimal right now, I think, with the lack of a, a round the clock two person setup. I think, I think, and without having the technology to really do it more efficiently, but you know, I think that's a goal. I'm, I'm, we didn't include it in any of our models, but it's something that Mayor Lawson asked us a number of years ago, and I think it's important to realize that if we build it, it's not just they will come, but we'll be the only ones in town, and, and if the state requires certain things or changes the way they give free dispatch service, it could open us up to really, I think, tremendous opportunity if we have it ready. Um, to go at that point. Um, if they suddenly say, well, we can't provide Berlin, but we'll provide X number of dollars for you to provide Berlin, um, I, 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 could, and I could entertain those as options in the future, future but I, I don't want to guarantee any of these revenue streams are, sure. are guaranteed. Councillor Higby. Have you considered a different implementation schedule? Sometimes changes happen a little bit more easy. Uh, if you phase in slowly. And it, it seems to me that you're, you're asking everyone to, to leap in. You've implied that we could have catastrophic circumstances arise if we don't leap in, which I have to say, I'm not comfortable with that style of approach, either by Front Porch Forum, I understand there have been some postings, or, or just even implying here in this meeting that, that things could get really bad really fast. I actually am very proud and pleased with the service that we get in Barry City, and I'm sure you are equally pleased with what happens here in Montpelier. While we could articulate the need to look at different types of communication advances, I don't think that we should necessarily jump to the other side of the coin this quickly. Having said that, I wonder if there is a different phasing in of this, of this idea so that we have a huge organization in place in Barry City. We might have an easier time looking at the budget figures and making some changes internally. We've tried the phased approach at the board level. Um, 
it's been met with lukewarm <laughs> reception and it's caused us to go back and forth in and uh, you know whether you do Montpelier first I know there was a period there where we were going to do Montpelier first and then phase in Barry in year two that was rejected um, you know for different reasons um, I don't rule it out I, I think it, anything could be on the table I think moving this the, the step forward I think will benefit everyone so a phased approach would work in my mind, it, it doesn't seem to work with the board at this point. And same I feel okay. like for okay. myself. I would push back at the comments I just heard you make, Councillor, that this is a strategy or a way of trying to push action. From my perspective, I think my comments have been consistent for the last year or year and a half, both in this council and at our meetings, that whether or not things move forward with CVPSA, we have a serious need for massive infrastructure rehaul and repair that haven't been done in decades and that there is a significant waiting risk of serious infrastructure failure. When you ask the word we, who are you referring to? This is based on the discussions, my interpretation of discussions we've had, including with capital fire mutual aid folks, the people who do the dispatching with the chiefs of police, with people who do policing on a day-to-day -day work and interact with the equipment we're discussing. We're using 20-year-old technology in the 21st century. I, I think it's, it's bound to break. But just, sorry, just a point of information. Are we hearing from the chiefs tonight as well? That'd be good. I think we could. I just, yeah, I just want to get a sense of how this, where the discussion is going to take us. Uh, Paco, Paco to answer I'd that. like to, uh, I'd like to address that last question. Um, in our, in our, uh, and I understand and agree, uh, if we go back three years when the CVPSA put together its original business case for wanting to do this, our recommended course of action was for CVPSA to take over governance and management and direction of both cities dispatching as they existed today so that we could work on trying to standardize policies and procedures, uh, minimize the impact of any transitional move to the employees out of their work environments, <coughs> take some time to uh, work on collective bargaining agreements, um, and really get a handle on cost and how to <coughs> share calls for service between the two centers. Um, that was, in my opinion, the uh, least invasive uh, approach to doing this. It caused for really a phased-in approach, which this board, the CVPSA board, endorsed 110 percent. And that was rejected by staff and the councils at this time. During the course of the last three years, uh, I have worked on putting together many variations of the original concept, the original alternatives. The original alternatives is in the business case for moving forward with trying to consolidate regionalized dispatching was keep the two centers operational as one alternative, collapse one center into the, the other center. Uh, another alternative was to build a new site. And the last alternative was the do nothing alternative. That was always recognized as, a, as an alternative. We have gone through and I think done do our due diligence in exploring every single one of those options. And we're at a crossroads at this point to either look at this plan, go back to the other two, or go to alternative D, which is the status quo. Uh, Donna, did you hear it? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Paco, because that was going to be my, one of my points. Um, the, the other piece is I would like to go back to the question about self-assessments. And although Pocket go, talked about it, he didn't refer to page 31, which is sort of the project timelines. And there are estimates there of days of endurance, uh, notice to proceed, how we would do things. And for sure, I would expect us to assess how we're doing. Are we taking longer? Uh, what went well, what didn't go well, and all along the way to be very clear that we would do self-assessment and we'd be very public and very transparent about it. So I just wanted to get back to that question. Thank you. And I would like to follow up on that because on page 16, it talks about uh, management and staff shall also work together to develop performance measures for the dispatch function. Baseline measurements will be established and tracked over time. One of the 
key components of CBPSA assuming responsibility for the dispatch function is to measure performance so that we can show success <laughs> or alter shortcomings. Uh, and at one, in one, and I didn't include it in this plan, but in one of the first iterations of the planning process, I took the time to develop uh, performance measures that addressed um, benchmarking, calls for service, time response, cost of service, et cetera. And it was not put in here because many of the staff at the time thought it was overreaching and a little unrealistic because we don't have the didn't, we didn't think we had the capabilities to uh, <clears throat> identify those benchmarks and hold people accountable. Well, quite frankly, it was intended to hold CBPSA accountable as to show progress in how we develop. Um, so tweaked it a little bit for this uh, version of the report, downplayed performance measurements, and made sure that I included staff being involved in helping us guide these performance measurements. Uh, one of the guiding principles of CBPSA that we've documented is try to be employee focused. And I've heard that loud and clear over the last three years from city councils. And to the extent that we can, we have tried to include that in our written material. Uh, you know, that's always, I'm, I'm sure staff may be sitting back saying, you know, that's nice to hear and the proof is in the pudding. but. The proof is in the pudding, and uh, that's one of those performance measures that I think we need to we need to uh, be accountable for. Councillor Batham. So just just I think so I'm clear as to what it sounds like you're hoping to get out of tonight. It sounds like you're looking from the council members present for a general. Do we see a path forward with this approach? or not based on where we're at tonight is that an, an accurate assessment of what i think we've explored every possible option for consolidating dispatch in central vermont and if you're not even willing to consider moving it forward we should just call it a day <laughs> because i don't know what else we can say you know we can say you know and, and it could be Yes, we're interested, but you need to meet this benchmark by this. You need to be, do this by then. You need to do this before we're going to give up control of any type of employee relation. That's fine. It's a commitment that, A, you'd consider it during your budgeting process that, you know, there is a need for some capital investment in both towns. Why not do it together? And B, can we do, should we do this in a single site? Is that the solution? Because I think, in our mind, it, it is, um, at least at this point, you know, unless Barry was going to say, well, we're going to double the, the size and we can throw everything over there and you're going to put a million bucks into it or something. And or conversely, if Montpelier is willing to invest a huge amount of money to add a third floor up under their police uh, building and, and, and expand that way, you know, other than that, if the, the other option is to build a new facility and spend 10 million bucks. And I just don't see that as an option. So I think we're at a crossroads yep. um, and it's either you do it or you don't, and, and we hope you at least move the process forward. So just to clarify that a little bit, I think there's the seating of authority, which is one question. There's also the other pieces, which is simulcast, and the other uh, abilities that we could entertain through well, the Central Public Safety. We've Department. kind of proposed simulcast. It was, it was proposed last year that we'd investigate it, and what we've realized is bonding $1.6 million amongst 20 towns is going to take more than just us at the table. It's going to take a road show. Um, between CVPSA and the Capital Fire Mutual Aid Group to go to each of those boards and say, listen, this is what we've come together as a board. And if, it, if it's that breakdown or not, I don't know. And maybe it's slightly different based on what people, what we negotiate or what we figure out is valuable. Um, that's going to take a 20 town tour to get back to Barry and Montpelier with, listen, we have all these towns signed up for a bond. Would you agree to us putting it on our ballot? And so that's a year long process. That, I don't want to even start unless you guys say that Barry and Montpelier would be okay with us pursuing that. Because that would be the worst. We, we go and promise all these towns that we're willing to do some digital upgrade. And then we come back to Montpelier and Barry and they say, no, you know, no way. You know, and, and it's just wasted effort. We lose goodwill. And you jeopardize relationships that you know, we may have built up with them being on the board and working with us. So we're not proposing that here other than 
if you want, we're willing to start that process. And uh, I envision that as a long process, about at least a year. So similarly, um, an interesting question, I think, is how a la carte is, uh, are any of these choices, right? Like, so in my head, we've got at least three things at play, right? S uh, single site, and then where is that single site? There's, uh, you know, CAD, and there's um, simulcast. So my assumption is that if we're still two separate sites, then we need two separate CAD systems. But I'm not sure about the simulcast. Two separate CADs to me is a, is a mistake because you're going to be paying two times what you could be doing jointly. And, and if you both need it and you're going towards a single site, why do it in one versus wait till you get to that point? I know it's a necessity, but it, they kind of go together. Can I address yeah. that? Uh, CAD is uh, computer aided dispatching is a best practice. Um, I don't want to. I, I, I don't want to say that um, the best practice is something that has to occur today, tomorrow. I have to acknowledge that the two uh, centers now have been operating for years without an official computer aided dispatch system. CVPSA has determined that that is something that will help increase the efficiency of dispatchers in a consolidated uh, environment. It's just a, it's a position the Board of Directors has taken. As far as simulcasts go, I, 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 I want to point out that simulcast is a radio project. It's a pro project that uh, is, really belongs to Capital Fire and Capital West. Um, it has uh, uh, maybe little impact on Barry City, except that, how, except in the context of if CVPSA manages it, what can, what would uh, enhanced radio communications look like for Barry City? I don't know what that is today, but we're looking at the best interests of everybody in Central Vermont. Uh, does it have any impact on the city of Montpelier today? And does the city of Montpelier have any obligation to uh, fund a radio simulcast system? Uh, I, I don't know. The contract with Capital West says that Capital West is responsible for radio communications. What I do know is that over the course of time that I've been around, that I've listened to, is the interference that is caused with the radio communications of Capital West is very frustrating to dispatchers. And we are trying to recognize that uh, another best practice in a regional center is to create the best radio communications that we can. And that's something we would want to do for the dispatchers. Other questions? Oh, the chiefs. Uh, if the chiefs would like to come up and make any comments. Sorry? Where would you like to? Oh, did you have a comment? Well, let yeah. me sit back down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we received an email uh, yesterday or the day before regarding whether or not we go dark in Barry City. And the issue at hand was the administrative positions. And I wanted to know if the Central Vermont um, Public Safety Authority would be handling those admin functions that currently the dispatchers in Barry do, such Mike, as record keeping. Next, the, the next stop, the TROs, et cetera. In part, yeah. we talked about that. Did you have an answer to that? Well, yeah. Yes, um, we have we have said, and I looked through this report, and and I didn't necessarily highlight in in this current report the administrative functions the that we would envision dispatchers assuming in the consolidated site. We would assume we have said before that we would assume as many of the administrative uh, functions that was reasonably uh, responsible to take over in a. Uh, a a site that's not in the police departments. Uh, we would provide assistance to uh, the police departments and the police officers where appropriate. But we would also take over, to the extent that we can, all of the criminal justice database uh, responsibilities as well. So 
Um, are there certain administrative functions that uh, still would be required in the two cities' police departments? Um, I think there may be, uh, and I don't know that we could do them all, but we would make every effort to, uh, to, to manage what we could. But there would be certain things that would not, you know, like CBPSA, run in your jail right. is not a dispatch related function. Yeah. We could put video technology for like a door, so if somebody came up to the door, they could, they could video link up to the single site with the dispatchers. We wouldn't have a person there, downtown Barry. So calculating the dark costs, and we've talked, Steve's been great, he's come to our meetings and, and we've tried to, we've, we, we didn't want to get into well, what are the policy issues in Barry City in regards to what do you want to leave there or what do you require there and then try to incorporate them in our budget. We figured it's easier to say, well, we'll do whatever we can that's currently being handled by the dispatchers in this other site, but stuff that needs to be handled in the Barry City uh, area right there, whether it's the jail. We've mainly talked about the jail function, um, uh, but the other administrative tasks I imagine we would uh, we continue as is, but that's what that's why I had Paco answer. Anything else? Okay. okay. Um, Chiefs, if you want to come up and make any comments. I'm sitting next to Paco. Yeah, sitting next Here, to let's put some. Chief Brandt. You want to be up here too, or? <laughs> if I don't, he will kick me under the table. <laughs> Hard to do that from the other side of the room, though, too. Those are mine. I, and I don't have another pair on me, which is unusual. I, I included your letter, too, for the packet I handed around. So they all have a copy of your letter. So for my council members, they've heard a lot of this last night. Um, one of my first questions is if CVPSA was to go forward, is the question of does Barry City go dark? Does Montpelier go dark? And what does that look financially? And what are our citizens' expectations when they see the police sign and you go to the front window and nobody's there at 6 o'clock at night? Um, that is a policy that the councils have to make independent decisions on. But it also comes with a financial component, depending on where you want to go with that. Um, in Barry City, that can be as simple as, and to answer Councilor Booten's question, I think two administrative people, and the way I came up with two, is I look what happens around the state when the state police consolidated into um, the PSAPs and put admin people in the barracks. Very familiar with that. I did almost 27 years with the state police. So um, they have admin staff during the day, but at five o'clock the place is dark. So admin staff to the day would probably be a dollar figure in the 150 to 160 range for two people for the for the week. Um, then I looked at what if we kept the lights on and we ran our jail, etc. That takes the price up considerably. Um, Things that we don't consider that have nothing to do with money, absolutely nothing to do with money, on going dark, closing our jail, and requiring that my officers have to transport people. Granted, there's overtime money involved in that. That's not my biggest concern. I have concerns about finding officers available to come in to transport prisoners to St. Johnsbury and or Chittenden County. And then what does that look like if you have a night like the night before last where it snowed all night? I worry about my safety of my officers. I worry about the safety of my prisoners. Do I pull staff that are supposed to be patrolling the city to do these transports? So those, those are other concerns. And in Barry City, Barry City PD did 199 lodgings. That's 199 transports. Am I going to burn my staff out by calling them in? at all hours. So th those are some of the other concerns. And I don't have an answer from the Barry City Council with regards to do we go dark, do we stay open? I know from my conversations in Montpelier that Montpelier had a building for a dollar and chose to build a PD downtown so that you had people here. Um, I have my own thoughts on what it's like to go to an office and not have anybody there, but I'll keep them out of that part. Um, the other thing is we talk about dispatching for Central Vermont and Montpelier and Barry going into one location and opening the doors for 
these other services. When we look at what people have for options now, as long as the Department of Public Safety is giving dispatching away for free, you are never going to be competitive if you're charging. Those conversations have been taking place in Montpelier. They got benched last session. I'm sure they're going to be coming around again this session. But as long as you have somebody out there giving dispatching away for free, it doesn't matter what we do. We're never going to be competitive. Um, you know, that's like a free bottle of water with no label on it versus one that says it's from a mountain spring in the Adirondacks. I'll take the free one. And this one's 10 bucks. Um, so that's a concern. And then when we talk about patchwork, and I've heard the different comments. I've heard comments from my staff about the patchwork of services. I want to be clear, in Montpelier, if you are a Montpelier citizen or a visitor or someone in need in Montpelier and you call for police, fire, or EMS, you get Montpelier dispatch, you get Montpelier police, fire, or EMS. The same holds true in Barry City. The same is true in Barry Town, except for your dispatch is all from Lamoille. It's our other little communities that we haven't brought into the fold and haven't got buy-in that are the communities that are patchwork. The patchwork for our communities only comes in in a mutual aid situation. And that is always going to be out there, particularly in law enforcement, if our mutual aid, as it is in Vermont a lot of times, is state police. State police, I believe, are always going to dispatch for themselves. Okay. Um, we talked about simulcast. Um, I had a long conversation with the deputy chiefs, Chief Brent, um, the city manager, last week. Last, yes. Yeah, last week. Sorry, I've been up since four. Um, last week about simulcast. I think there are some great benefits to simulcast. Question is, do the communities want to pay the price for it? I think it solves a lot of problems. Um, I do agree with. Tom, that someone has to do a horse and pony show to all those small communities um, under capital fire mutual aid. But I don't see um, the, the, the figure for the added income. I don't see that coming as long as DPS is willing to dispatch for communities free. And we have communities around here that are dispatched from three different entities. But Montpelier, Barry City, and Barry Town are not those three, or any of those communities. Um, so I think that takes your money down, and I think your savings go away when we look at what's available out there. And I think until the question, when we talk strictly money, until the question of what the city's expectations are of their departments on, do I go there at 9 or 10 o'clock at night? and find nobody there, or somebody got to be there, until those dollar figures ironed out, this has the potential to cost you a lot more money. Might be break even, might cost you money. Is it something that's going to happen in the future? I think it will, but I don't think it's going to happen until DPS stops giving dispatching away. Other chiefs? Um, so I'll touch upon uh, also the um, what is the, the current condition of capital of capital fire mutual aid radio infrastructure? And there is no question that it is uh, very old. It does need to be upgraded and replaced at some point. Is it? Uh, are we on the verge of catastrophe? Uh, no, we are not. We, you know, but it this does need to happen. I don't know. And, and again, in our letter, we talked about who does take the lead. Uh, that's something that we're, you know. Uh, Given our contractual model, that's Montpelier might not might necessarily not be the, the lead entity. Um, I just want to make clear that it's something that does need to happen. Uh, but again, how it's not, it's not an, an emergent crisis because for the public safety, people need to be reassured too that there are also are redundant systems, you know, in, in in a crisis. But it's something that needs to happen. Montpelier, we're really very fortunate. Um, that we did up, we were able to upgrade uh, to a digital uh, simulcast system on the police side. So we do have the um, very current uh, technology for the Montpelier Police Department. Um, 
and and uh, but it's still without you know we're still working through some some bugs, uh, and some of that has to do with our inability uh, to do single site sourcing um, on the on the uh, on the grant at the time. Um, so, but that being said, so uh, but again, just putting that in, in the proper perspective of of what we're up against, um, and as far as the you know we don't operate a jail in Montpelier. So some of our operational challenges and needs are not the same as Berry City, uh, but they would they would they would impact us um, to a certain extent. And I think, uh, as uh, Chief Bombardier said, uh, especially here in Montpelier, that's a that's a community conversation to what is the level of service and that expectation for the Montpelier Police Department uh, at different hours. I think I think the culture is different today uh, and the acceptance of technology than certainly uh, that Chief White was faced with back in the late 90s on whether or not uh, do we you know, build out the armory you know, out on, on uh, East Montpelier Road as the new public safety site where we would have been potentially co-located or just the police department. Um, and uh, the community was very, very clear that it is worth the investment uh, given a small footprint that we had to build our police department that we beat downtown. Um, so is that the same today? I don't know and I would really, you know, uh, I, there are technological solutions, and you know, Essex Police Department is an example. We're from Octillier, that I would certainly see where you could come into a lobby. There would be a virtual presence um, where the dispatcher could see the person. You could see what's happening. They could see, you know, read their facial expression. Are they in immediate danger? Is somebody chasing them in there? There are technological things that they can do. Can they can control remotely the door access, for example? Um, so those are options. Um, but again, that would be uh, uh, for my. That's, I'm speaking solely for my pillar and what the, those implications would be in service delivery. Um, and right now, as I as I said, and I'm also uh, in agreement with our folks from Capital West, and that's really Montpelier's partner right now. Even though they're also they're also a member of the board, we need to see. Um, and for me to make a recommendation, I need to see something with some some degree of specificity as far as what is this plan or option going to be equal to or ideally better than um, what we have exist that exists today given the partnership today because we as, as, you know we we don't have Barry town um, we don't have Berlin although Montpelier does provide the dispatching as part of capital fire mutual capital West rather we do provide the dispatching for the Berlin Fire Department, the Berlin Fast Squad, the Northfield Ambulance Service, and the Northfield Fire Department. Public State Police provide free dispatching to the Northfield Police Department after after hours and on the weekends. So that's kind of where we're at when you look at what are the potential partners. Also, we provide dispatching for Waterbury uh, Fire Department and Ambulance Service. Um, so again, uh, you know, we also have to make be careful. Uh, and this was stated in the past as well that. Through, with Capital West and the, and the 17 communities that we provide service for in Montpelier, we need to make sure that we don't build out infrastructure, hire employees, and do everything based solely on contractual relationships. And that's something that um, what, you know, very proud of our, our collective work, our collaborative work, I should say, with Capital West. That even though it's still technically yes, it's a contract, but it really is a partnership. The input that they have provided and uh, working with our dispatch supervisor Fred Cummings, who's here, uh, to improve, especially on the fire side. Systems, you know, so there's been a lot of a lot, a lot of uh, things happening. That's what a partnership does. How do we improve public safety? Whether you're out in Callis, whether you're on Main Street, Montpelier, and that's something we're proud of. And it's not a broken system. And, and uh, you know, as Kimchani has pointed out, but is it the best system? There's always a better op better way of doing things. There's usually a price tag attached with that. But I, but I am committed to working and staying with Capital West, as I've said both in council meetings as well as in, in the authority meetings. Uh, that's where we're at. And lastly, I just want to also add uh, just a few points um, that I'm, I'm really, uh, no matter what happens, the work that was done by this board and, um, was not for nothing. And I really want to drive that point home uh, because it has provided uh, training opportunities. Uh, we just had two dispatchers, we're just in Montreal at, at an APCO conference to specifically look at and, and learn more about CAD, CAD systems, uh, introduce new ideas and new way of and, and thinking. Uh, and I think one of the biggest ones, even though uh, Chief Bombardier and I have worked since I was a, you know, a, a rookie uh, auxiliary trooper in 1985, uh, so long we've been around, um, 
but it really pushed us further to the continuity of operations planning, the bridge system, which now at least uh, creates a redundant ability. So if something were to happen, we had to evacuate the Montpelier Police Department, we could dispatch all of our clients out of the Berry City Police Department and vice versa. That's, that's something that I think happened a lot sooner because of uh, a lot of conversations. There's a lot of ways of looking at it because of, this, of the authority. And um, they provide a radio console for our police department, uh, so a third console that was needed. Um, and I think overall, I was kind of, you know, counselor, you, you, know, you alluded to the, the relationships of, of communities. And I think those are all things that I'm, you know, I'm very grateful for. Um, even though I don't think right now, depending on what level uh, you want to, you know, I, I just, um, if it's just put, turning over the, the authority of, of what we know and what's at stake to an unknown at the moment, that's what makes me nervous. And that's why I don't recommend a full seating of authority um, at this time. Uh, because again, limited partnership of other communities. Uh, and that's, and that's and what is the detail, more detailed plan um, because I'm pretty nervous about a leasing site, moving everything into one area, you know, and there's a lot of physical security requirements for the staff in particular, um, as well as the technology and the, and the redundancies from, from weather generated power, which, which definitely would be part of that proposal, um, to then moving again to a, a hopefully uh, an owned location. So again, and thinking what do we currently have right now? And, it, and also, we do not know what level of leadership the legislature will or will not uh, take, uh, you know, in, in kind of leveling the playing field, if you will. And, uh, you know, and I'll say this, I do need to consider, or whoever's in my position or leads, you know, what's the from the police department, if we go to a single site, that person, you know, may have to consider it being a single stage site with a, a peace app. Because we, again, there's a lot of unknowns there. And I think, and, and lastly, I just want to say, no matter what happens, there is now a foundation. There is a roadmap for how communities can come together on this. Um, and I just that's, I know I kind of said a lot of things here, but that's uh, what we've been, our message has consistently been with the board meetings um, and our participation with this effort. Do you, do you have something to add? I wanted to, add? to springboard off two things that Chief <laughs> goes. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, other things that have come of this and before most of the CVPSA board members were around, I've been involved in this conversation for almost 11 years now, and the two things that we said from the start that weren't there that are in place now is an equitable sharing plan and a governance model, which are huge. Don't want to harp on dollar things, but one of the things that's in here that nobody's mentioned is the thought that our two communities would maintain our radio systems that we have in place at our departments now. That comes with a fee. Sorry. That's great. No. Okay. Uh, so, oh, come here. I do get a question. So current state, when when there's a problem in the jail cell, what what is what actually happens right now? So it depends on what the problem is. Uh, honestly, if it's a medical problem, sorry, if it's a medical problem, we would call medical staff and an officer. If it were a fire, dispatch would let people out. I mean, there's there's a pamphlet that's been approved by the federal government to operate a jail. That's the part. Those are the procedures. All of those require people inside the building. Okay. Um, and, and I think you asked last night, we, we don't have a desk sergeant. I know we see on TV where they have a desk sergeant, somebody that's in the building all the time. We don't have that type of setup. Okay. Um, and what does Montpelier do with when you have arrests if you don't have a jail cell? Um, most of our arrests do not require lodging. Um, and we use, the, uh, if it's a detox, whatever possible, um, and again, it, that's Washington County Mental Health call, uh, but we use the lighthouse um, if they're gonna be a low risk person for us, you know, where they can go uh, uh, to be, to, you know, to sober up safely. And, uh, yeah, but we will transport. Um, and we have also used Berry City, um, and, but again, um, we're used to the, you know, we, in many cases, if we have a difficult prisoner, 
chances are we're going to take them to one of the correctional facilities because what we cannot happen is, you know, one shift will bring that, that prisoner to Berry City and there's a problem. Now it might be 4 o'clock in the morning. There's two, there's two police officers on for the entire city of Montpelier, and now we've got to transport that person because they can no longer stay at Berry City to uh, St. Johnsbury, which is the usual spot. Okay. Because we were, and we'll just do that. You know, we just deal with it and make call in folks, and we'll do the transport. The the email that we received, we have about 199 um, prisoners in a given year. So that, if I was reading the email correctly, would would that be correct? That's that's the way I read it. That we would be 199. What <laughs> we were told last night too. Yes. Yeah, 199. Those are prisoners, our prisoners, Barry City. Yes, yeah. And. And what I'm here that's a huge that's a huge difference between Montpelier and Barry City when there's only like what two thousand difference in residents. Uh, wow. So to rephrase the question, um, <laughs> so basically, why are we arresting 199 people? Or it sounds so, like in Montpelier, so 199 prisoners are both detox at Washington County Mental Health did not feel were safe at the lighthouse because. We do the same thing that, Barry, that Montpelier does in Barry, is bring people to the White House when Washington County Mental Health says they are. Other people that need to be incarcerated or can't make bail conditions, we will hold them in Barry City for up to 72 hours. Um, we very rarely transport people to Chittenden or St. John's Barry unless they are unmanageable from the start. And we have exactly what Chief Fakels is talking about. We have caught, been caught. Uh, second, third shift comes in, and somebody becomes unmanageable, and you have to call officers in and transport them to a regular Department of Corrections facility. So, so the bail piece is that more consistent with the courthouse? Is that what you're saying? So um, the bail. I mean, we call for bail on people when it's appropriate. And if they make bail, they get a citation to appear in court based on what the court conditions of release were. Um, but the, uh, there's also another 60, roughly, I'm going from memory now, 60, 60 plus people that get lodged at Barry City from other departments. I want to make clear, too, that as far as it's Vermont Rules of Criminal Procedure, which, right. which spells out um, what shall be done when we have somebody that's arrested. So it's not a, a discretionary difference between Barry or Montpelier. I just want to make that point clear. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, it's rule three. Yeah. And we follow rule three with regards to you know, people in custody and setting bail, et cetera. And it's trending that fewer people will be incarcerated. Um, I think that's a, a general, that's where it, it's kind of. We will heavy. see. <laughs> For the record, I wasn't insinuating that. No, no, my concern was that people left and right in Barry City. What, what my concern was is that you don't have any, and we have 199, which is a huge difference. And that's, well, I mean, how Unless, many? Uh, no, I'm. I was not asked, and I've not supplied the number well, okay, of people sorry. that we lodge in Montpelier. Right. Oh, okay. So, so let's just yeah. be clear. The number is not zero. We do. People do go to jail sometimes. Right. Well, we have we have two holding cells, and you know, so we still have to. Uh, uh, but they are they are just that we um, they are not considered a, a, a longer term. So they're just basically there until the paperwork is processed, and then they either go on to either uh, a release or, um, depending on uh, a correctional facility, to which would include the option to go to Barry City, which we also will take advantage of as well. How about how many of those do you have? I, do, uh, I don't have that number. I can tell you that, you know, roughly we arrest anywhere from uh, 250 to 300 people annually, um, but the vast majority of those are not lodged. So that does not include detoxes. And would we be in a similar position if we went to a single site that that would not become available? or that that would not be an option yeah what it does it just would just make sure that then anybody that we would um, you know on the, on the criminal side they would need they would have to be transported to most likely st. Johnsbury with a transport team which is is you know is, is two officers to transport okay. and women would go to uh, Chittenden County Correctional Center okay well 
so if there's, oh, okay, yeah, go ahead. Um, so I'm just trying to wrap my head around the, the different options here. And can you clarify a little bit um, the, so $125,000 initial investment for the CAD, um, either together, 125000 or if we were to do it separately, we'd each pay twice. Is that, is there any way to use CVPSA um, to buy it once for both of us under our existing, if we did nothing else um, under our existing structure? Well, we wouldn't be able yeah. to use it. So. And I, I kind of left that out because I didn't want to continue to talk when I thought Councilor Bratham had another <laughs> thing to go. But no, uh, what I have is more discussion than it is okay. questions. So with regards to CAD, and I talked about this last night with my council, um, two weeks ago I attended the statewide Valcor meeting with the chiefs, any, any Valcor users. So for people that don't know Valcor, it is a police record management system that was developed in Vermont. It was the brainchild of Mike Sherling, who was the chief of Burlington. Uh, PD and some of his staff members they went to a company in California and said this is our vision can you build it it has morphed into a record ma management system that is Vermont based we do things differently in Vermont in case you haven't noticed that serves Vermont law enforcement with regards to what we're trying to get out of our records when we do searches and and how we want to store things Valcor has just taken some huge steps and moved people, staff people, to Vermont with the idea of servicing Vermont and, and keeping the Valcor Vermont model going while developing it outside of Vermont for sale to other entities outside of Vermont. We are a partner agency, so Montpelier, Burlington, Berry City, the sheriff's departments that are using Valcor are a partner agency, and we have a governance board that when we want something new, we, we bring it to the board, they decide. One of the things that's on the table is CAD, and part of that discussion has been driven a lot by Chief Locke of the fire department in Burlington, but based on the conversations I heard two weeks ago, CAD in some form connected to Valcor is in the future. Um, what it looks like, total cost, don't know. Is it going to be Valcor CAD or is it going to be an outside vendor partnered with Valcor that has, you know, um, a connectivity for sharing information? But that is on the table and part of the discussion with Valcor. So that $125,000 for each agency could be greatly reduced. So I guess I would ask Tom to comment on that because the report really implies that you think that this probably isn't likely to happen with Valcor in the near term. Well, I, well Valcor, I don't know much. I know we both use Valcor. So if there is some entity that, that some new product that comes out that can integrate with Valcor, obviously we have to investigate it and see if it's worth it. In terms of your question in regards to licensing fees, I can't imagine CVPSA could purchase one and use it for both Barry and Montpelier, even though they're just members of CVPSA. I think they would have to be, and I imagine you have to check with the license agreement that it would be employees of CVPSA, and that's what you're buying the license for. Um, it, it, I, I cannot imagine that we could share it, buy it, and then share it with our member towns, but that's something we could look into. I think it's worth looking into because, okay. I mean, if that is an option, that makes some of this math very different for us. And oh, definitely. So, it, it, we're not just blindly saying we're going to yeah. spend it. We're saying <laughs> this is the worst case scenario we think could happen in either town if we go it alone. And if we can find savings either working through Valcor or getting a cheaper alternative that can integrate easily, that can solve the same problem, I think we'd, we'd explore that. But you can't do it unless you're at the table and you're kind of working together to work through these issues. And I think that's where we've felt CVPSA provides that bridge. Other comments or questions? Okay. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much to the CVPSA board for doing so much work on all of this uh, and to the chiefs, you know, also, you know, for spending time and working through all these great questions. And uh, so I think it's probably about the time for us to, uh, as our respective councils, sort of weigh in. I mean, I, at least I'll speak for Montpelier in saying that I don't anticipate any vote tonight, um, but I think it'd be good to give a sort of uh, 
uh, you know, general sense of where, uh, what you're interested is in moving forward. Does that seem fair, Montpelier? Okay. Do you want to say anything about that? Uh, just ditto. I mean, if okay. you want, we could actually <laughs> just go around the room like we did before and see people's interest. I'm, th I'm wondering if it makes sense to do like one council and then the oh. other. I don't know. Just because, like, just yeah. to have a. Because otherwise, you have to, you know. Are you going to hear any public comments? Oh yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> I'd like to inform Please those, do. Those, uh, sure, people. and so and not just uh, Stephen, but if anybody else from the public has comments, uh, now would be a great time. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Stephen Whitaker, Montpelier. I have been engaged with this process not as closely as the CVPSA board members. I've spoken to both this Barry City Council prior to your joining, but on this topic, I've suggested that you be more engaged, more than at a drop dead date. Um, I want to acknowledge and commend the work that Tacos and his uh, governing advisors have completed so far, but it is far from sufficient or actionable. Um, this started as a failover redundant two site concept where either site could carry the full load for the entire uh, authority's jurisdiction. Uh, that's a fundamental design principle that we have strayed from. We, can, we have to move back to the idea of full failover potential. Either site could be damaged by bomb, flood, flood, fire, poison, whatever, and you need the full capacity to exist, both in equipment and personnel at the redundant site. The, tech, the technology and communications have to be designed that way as well. Um, the technology and communications between the, all the repeaters need to be designed in a ring architecture so one tree falling doesn't create a huge dead zone among the tra transmit dispatch area. That type of planning has not been done. Uh, the local presence keep alive concept, the idea that people who have been here living, sometimes, some on the margins, know that they can go to behind the building here to the police station and get help. If that were to go dark, it's not sufficient to have a video camera if you can find your way to it and figure out how to engage it. Uh, you imagine. The scenario that comes to mind is an OD victim stumbling and hoping to find someone and they see a TV screen and they're dead before the people arrive. Stephen, uh, could you speak into the mic? Oh. Thank you. Sure, I didn't realize I wasn't. That's uh, okay. I don't know. Uh, so the, no, there's no telecom plan. Fundamentally, we need to inventory where our repeaters are, where there's fiber, where there's not. This plan refers twice to relying on consolidated communications. We're talking tens of thousands of dollars per month, at least, in communications costs here. That's a significant percentage of these budget estimates you're seeing. We've also just formed a fiber district that could and should prioritize building to the, the needed sites for this public safety imperative. We don't need to be hemorrhaging a million dollars a year or two out to consolidated communications. It just doesn't make sense. The planning is... Uh, the simulcast plan, I re adamantly reject sole sourcing anything, especially just on the thin concept that we have to choose one vendor. Harris and Motorola both make good stuff. Other vendors can provide Motorola. I haven't heard any sound reason for not using standard bidding processes, especially on million dollar purchases. Uh, there's no labor management plan. The failover resilience plan. There's no plan for a PSAP. I did, I do commend Chief Fakos for bringing that up tonight. Montpelier was a PSAP when I helped design the first 911 system in the early 90s. And it should be a PSAP again. The reasons it got out of PSAP were related to politics and mismanagement of the state 911 governance issue. Both Barry and Montpelier could be PSAPs and fail and with full failover capacity for each other. Um, there's no political legislative plan. There's no no one has yet articulated that we need the legislature this year to weigh in and resolve whether or not the state police are going to give free dispatch to to towns that want to freeload, and whether or not it's okay that Lamoille County Sheriff can. Uh, 
dispatch marginally effectively for a town 35, 40 miles away and basically disrupt the economics and the uh, convening of this district or the, con the con concept of the district. Barry Town needs to be an essential partner here, but we're not going to get there until we create the uniform training standards and great, get the uniform quality control of everybody's services up to where Barry feels safe. That, that's fundamental. And it's probably not okay for Barry to, well, I, I don't want to get too mired in it because I know I'm. In, you're at about four to minutes right now. Well, I just I, wanted to. I asked you. It's okay. I just want to be conscious this is of the time. A, a topic it's okay. That I've asked to come in and speak to you for a half That's an hour. That's fine. I'm not cutting you off. I just want okay. you to know. There's no privacy plan. I mean, we hear casual references to Valcor and CAD, but. I have done my own FOIA request of the Valcor system. There's 20 years of erroneous, inaccurate, unsubstantiated rumor and innuendo in there. And there's no provision for public access to it uh, or expungement of it. We, you need fundamentally need a privacy plan. We are not building uh, Big Brother. You need strict standards on what's collected, what's, re what's expunged, what's accessible, what's correctable. Um, the short hold and transportation plan, they've covered it as well. This will not work. CVPSA is a, a consolidated dispatch and consolidated call answering, single stage dispatch. PSAP answering and dispatch is a good concept. It is where we need to be headed, but we're not on that track yet. Um, this will not work if we do not get the economics of Waterbury, Berlin, Northfield, and Barrytown at the table. It is insufficient to create the illusion of a bigger membership by roping in capital fire mutual aid and giving them two votes for 26 towns. The, the governance model is not, is not cooked yet. This, the CV fiber governance model, the communications union district, is one town, one vote, and I've continually pitched that. But until we get Berlin in, which, result, which requires Secretary of Administration and the legislature resolving whether they really do get 20 years of free dispatch for hosting a battle hospital. We're, until Berlin's at the table, this will not work. But Berlin, Northfield, Waterbury, Barry and Montpelier, and Barry City, Montpelier, that's a viable economic model to pay for the simulcast system to, to do what you're trying to do. Um, the telecom plan needs to be both for public safety and for broadband. We, we cannot ignore the gaps in both the LM, public safety radio, LMR, or the cell. We, we need to integrate this with, we need to quickly fill the gaps in the cell coverage just so people can call for help if they run off the road. These priorities are not even visible in this plan. So I'm trying to say, keep up the momentum. Don't, don't just call it all to a stop. It will not stop here, but the current path we're on is not well, I have more to say, but you got to make a, a special meeting or invite me. I mean, I sat here for 35 minutes of housing advertising. <laughs> I, I anticipate we may have other meetings too, and I, you know, we certainly want to hear your thoughts. Um, but uh, just out of respect for everybody's time too, like, please feel free to, to write well, if to you us. Want to speak and I get another minute sure, to that's fine. <laughs> other public uh, or other comments from the public. Okay. Uh, yes, I wanted it? to specifically, I mean, there are uh, employees of the, the various departments um, here, and so if I want to invite uh, them to speak and, and us to hear their voices if they would like to. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I, they're not just members of the public. They're very impacted by this. Or, or Ms. Earl, if you have anything. No. How much more do you got, Stephen? One minute. Okay. Uh, fundamentally, I, I want to second that point. That, that the, having the full buy-in from the people who are doing the work and, and seeing this as a advancement path and an upgrade and better pay and higher skills and, and a path to management level, that, that's fundamental and that's not here. Um, I would say plan first, set aside the discussion of seeding authority. Just that's a year, two years, three years out. Uh, 
get the legislature to resolve the issue of poaching, long distance dispatching, and uh, Berlin's uh, free ride uh, confusion. Build, if we do the telecom planning for our member communities, both for broadband LMR cellular, that's going to build the trust and the cooperation from which you could then get closer to the point of people seeding authority. Um, integrate the, the functions incrementally. As you inventory the telecom infrastructure, you can inventory the trucks and the specialized equipment that different departments have. Um, don't lose momentum. Let, let the momentum that has been built here throw us into the next phase, but it's going to take some real diligence on all of y'all's part, more so than CVPSA, to define what that next stage looks like. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, yes. I would just like to, uh, one, one final comment, mm -hmm. I'll be quick. It's a personal note. I've been before uh, the two councils for the last three years. Um, I've produced varying documents. Um, you have all listened uh, attentively and shown a lot of courtesy to uh, my efforts personally. You've provided me with uh, direction and constructive criticism where appropriate. And I want to thank you for that. Thank you, Paco. Um, so, oh, Donna, yeah? I mean, I was just looking at the agenda. I mean, maybe Barry City has it to it, but we have an agenda item. It has a little sheet. And, and on the sheet, I just want to read this because I don't see any asks for succeeding authority. Is shall the City Council support CVPSA's timeline as presented and support the plan to move forward with its implementation or attach any conditions to the CVPSA's planning process deemed necessary by the City Council? So it's more of a nod, do we keep moving ahead or don't we? Mm -hmm. And if it's a nod to move ahead, then what do you need to make that possible so we can follow and insert what we need to in our own timelines and measure whether we're getting there or not as we move forward to what your input is? Thank you. So I wanted to defer to um, Mayor Herring's idea here and just go around. <laughs> Does that well, and if uh, Donna started, then uh, we could just work around the table. Do you have anything more you want to add to like what you think <laughs> about what we should do? <laughs> well, I, I support the, st of the statement that we encourage them to move ahead. And if other council members want to insert conditions that they should be looking for, benchmarks, then great. Sure, so I'll try to be pretty brief here. And uh, just wanted to say I think the committee's done a tr tremendous amount of work here and uh, really appreciate the time and effort that's gone into it. Um, you know, I, I support upgrading the technology, no question. Um, I support the look at regionalization. There's no question in my mind on that either. Um, I think uh, the uncertainties um, are still, in my mind, outweighing the benefits uh, of adopting this timeline at this point. You know, I've spent too much time over in the State House to have any confidence that in the next biennium we're going to get many answers to these questions. Uh, and I do look, I come from a labor background, I look at sort of equating the Act 46, you know, collective bargaining structure to this. It, it makes me very nervous, to be honest. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I'm reluctant to say, like, stop what you're doing, you know, but as far as, like, giving a green light to the timeline at this point, um, I'd have to say I don't feel confident it's ready for prime time. So that's just where I'm coming from. But thanks very much, everybody. All right, I, I guess it's time to echo, echo the thank yous for people's time and, and effort um, in this and, and multiple presentations under a lot of circumstances. And I guess I'd have to echo my previous uh, speaker, Montpelier City Council, uh, about my hesitancy in the face of it seems quite obvious uh, that there is more research related to a lot of nuts and bolts and in infrastructure. Um, I would like to acknowledge uh, our uh, member from the public. I, uh, I, I thank Donna for her term, phonetically deaf. So I, I can't really Stephen get your name Whitaker. out of that. Stephen Whitaker. Stephen Whitaker. Um, I, I think your comments about uh, the nuts and bolts aspect of this are very appropriate and need to be looked at quite seriously. 
And given that, I am reticent to say, hey, let's jump in and see where this goes. Um, as another Green Council member, uh, all of this is uh, pretty deep and detailed for me. Uh, I can't say that I grasp everything fully. Uh, I really appreciate um, all of the work that everyone has done, for sure. As far as I can see it at the moment, um, the, the CVPSA plan is something that I'd be happy to support. At the same time, uh, I really hear the chief saying uh, none of this is going to work well until the state uh, makes its move. Uh, and in, in some ways, uh, I'm hopeful that all of the work that the CVPSA and, and everyone else has done over the years will mean that when the state clarifies, uh, we will be in a, in a great position. I hear CVPSA saying w we need to do more than that beforehand. Uh, I don't see that we have the, the, the will to do that uh, <coughs> as a group now. Um, that's my sense of the, the broad position, but I, I would say as far as the, the, the report of the CB, CVPSA tonight, I, I think it is satisfying and great. And I think that the, the idea of consolidating makes a lot of sense to me for a lot of reasons. Um, for now, I would defer to the chiefs. So. A very ambitious um, and lofty plan, and thank you for your work. Um, I, I find that I, I tend to be real meat and potatoes in my personality, so when I see faults in the business plan and, and projections of revenues and expenses that, that don't seem to be explained with clarity, I, I kind of put my fist down and I start to wonder about other aspects. So I think that the idea is good. I wonder about how some aspects, the most important ones, could potentially be phased in. But at this point, I don't feel like this is a document that I can support because I, I see that the, the projections just don't seem to be based in, in material that I accept to be forthcoming. And uh, it needs more work. But thank you very much. So uh, I'm very interested in um, continuing the conversation. I think there's been a lot of great work done, and uh, I think this has a lot of potential. And uh, just as far as uh, you know, where we go from here, uh, there probably are, I, not probably, there are details that we should probably be fleshing out uh, further. And I, I think where we are right now actually makes a lot of sense, uh, because you probably wouldn't want to get into too many of the weeds. Um, uh, and doing all the work of, of research if you were to find out, you know, that uh, n neither council wanted to do this. And um, so I think, we're, I think we're at an appropriate place right now. Um, and I would love to have more conversation um, about it and find out those details. <coughs> So uh, I'm going to reiterate the, uh, the thank you. So thank you, Paco, for all the work that you've done, the CVPSA board, um, Martin, the other members that are here that we've appointed to do the work on our behalf, uh, the chiefs in general. Um, the chiefs, I know that you've been spending a lot of time with the board uh, to get all of the work done. And it has been mentioned, but the uh, city managers that are in the room, along with the other staff uh, that have been a part of the, the process, the dispatchers themselves, as well as the supporting staff that represent them. Um, and actually, thank you to both of the councils. We do have some people that are newer, some people that have been here for a long time listening to the different iterations of the process. So uh, it has been a good conversation. In the report itself, it actually states some, some items that I think are, are what we're addressing here. So on page five, it was talking about uh, the governor's veto of S-273, um, which means that there was uh, future conversations that were needed. And I, I think that's what we're basically saying here is, uh, we, we like what you're doing, we like what you've presented, but there are still more discussions that are needed on the details of, of what that's uh, being presented to us. So 
I don't want to belabor it by just repeating everybody. So um, with that, I'll pass. Uh, yeah, repeated thanks all around for this work. Um, I think, um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be abundantly clear. Uh, it's a very firm no from me uh, about going dark in Berry City. Um, and and that's, a, that's a policy discussion that the city council will have to have in the future, but it will be opposed by me. Um, and I think if that is a step on the road to the actualization of this plan, I don't see how I can support it. I think conceptually, the regionalization of public safety makes absolute sense. It's the future. We have to do it. We can't keep going it alone with, at the rate that our communities continue to get smaller, and, and we are some of the largest among them. And I don't see how continuing down this road in the long term makes sense. But the, one of the intangibles that came up tonight was thinking about the impact of our local prisoners in Montpelier. Um, if you know, pursuing this model would mean that Barry would go dark and that there would no longer be a jail there. Um, you know, we currently do have a benefit of transporting our, our prisoners there, not just an impact on our, our force here, but also on the prisoners themselves and thinking about them as members of our community and, you know, now there is an option to be closer and to have to go to, um, to St. Johnsbury or to Indian County. Um, and, you know, safety and just, going through a traumatic experience from, from their perspective as, as a prisoner. Um, so uh, there are these intangibles and I want us to take some time to really evaluate them um, and then compare that to the benefits. And I see that there are a lot of, there are wonderful benefits here. You know, having two dispatchers on staff all the time is obviously a thing to work towards. So. It's not a no from me, but it's not as much of a yes as I sort of expected going into this um, because I think we've got some more work to do here internally. Um, one, sorry, before, <laughs> one final thing um, is I really want us to collectively work together on simulcast um, improvements. Uh, I understand um, that this is more of a concern for Montpelier um, being that we are currently um, responsible through a contract um, for all the folks in Capital West. Um, but it's more than that. It's, it's being a member of this community and driving through all these small towns. And if I get in a car accident out in Callis or one of my constituents gets in a car accident out you know, in one of these small towns, we are impacted. You know, even though we don't live in those towns, we're impacted because we travel through them. So I do think that that's a regional problem. And I absolutely want us to be pursuing it. I'm excited by um, you know, the potential of, of sharing that cost. Um, certainly the $20,000 seems uh, you know, uh, totally doable from our perspective as one city included in you know, when we divide it up among all of us. So I, I really hope to see us move forward um, in that direction. Go ahead. Yeah. So count, uh, sorry, Mayor Herring had mentioned, you know, there's some that have been here since the beginning. Um, I am one of those counselors that have been here since the formation of the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. Um, I supported it then. I supported it two years ago when I ceded authority in Barry City, and I support it tonight. Um, you know, I, and unfortunately, the thing that we've been doing is every single time you you hit a goalpost, we decide to move it. So. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> I haven't noticed. <laughs> Given the opportunity, I'm glad you noticed. let's let's see if we can move it one more time. Um, if you could, in your your next presentation, include you know video kiosks at the the police departments, and um, and now now that the jail cell issue is is really coming forth, um, why not have the jail cell at the new facility? Um, that would take care of that problem. It would be more centralized than what it is now um, because you're looking at probably Berlin to, to have the, the dispatch center. That would take care of that problem. And the, the, um, the kiosk, the video kiosk, would take care of the going dark problem. So with that, my support, 
Paco, you know that. I've had many conversations with you. I've had conversations with Martin. I've had conversations with Mike. I'm very supportive of the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority, and that's where I stand. So my worry at this point is that we haven't, I, I worry that we haven't been clear enough about where we go from here uh, or what happens next. Um, I mean, one, I, I'll just speak for myself and say what I could anticipate is that, um, at least for Montpelier, I feel like we need another meeting um, about about these costs you know, that, that Rosie brought up or you know, what this really means for us and what we're really um, interested in or what specifically, like what details um, we might need further. And that doesn't necessarily give you a direction at the moment, um, but it, uh, at least from our end, it feels like there's more conversation that needs to happen. Um, Montpelier, does that seem reasonable, or do you, if I've got that wrong somehow, that's okay. Further, any comments about that coming from Montpelier? We, that we need to put this on another agenda and talk about it again sometime. Yeah. So, I know that there was discussion earlier from some counselors about appointed members. I'm an elected member. Could you the, sit oh, by the, or you can stand over there. That'd be great, yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> my back to many, many people. Okay. So again, Sam Dworkin, I'm an elected member of the authority at large. I'm not an appointed member, so I may be able to speak some more differently. But what I've taken from tonight, and I know there will be further communication, but what I've taken as a whole from the councils is that on the whole, they prefer to be regional Sam, public safety is important. Can you closer to the mic, please? Yeah, sorry. Is that regional public safety as a goal is important, but what I'm hearing overall from the councils is that they would prefer to be followers on that, not leaders. And that's just... To the councils, that's my takeaway as a member of the board. That's what I've heard tonight as a whole from the board. So if, so if the message is different, I would like more communication to me or to us as a whole as to from that. I think we're not ready yeah. to lead on this yet, though I think yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Anyway. So for Barry City, we did have a meeting last night. We were provided some information. Some of that information, which you hear, is called going, going dark or keeping the lights on. It really is the 24-7 services that are currently in place. Um, it ranged from 250 to 400,000 additional dollars to this plan here. So when we're talking about you know seating authority, it really is a much bigger uh, budget conversation. So uh, I think uh, we've heard a lot of information for our council. I don't think we've uh, warned it for a decision tonight either. Um, so we would have to have a meeting if uh, we were to do anything further. Um, does anybody else on our council agree or disagree? I, I think you basically summed it up pretty well right there mm -hmm. for the Bear City side. Um, is, uh, what would you think about, um, do we need to do this together again or separately? Well, it's a separate action for each of us, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, if one of us decides not to move forward, it is a partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be something that does um, make ultimately a decision for the other body. Um, you do have a, th a third body at play now as well. I don't know if you're entertaining other groups, um, but that's a some input that would probably be good for us to have. But it sounds like if we're the two uh, groups at the, the party here, then uh, it, if one of us decides no, then it's going to be a no for both. Correct? Well, Montpelier and Capital West are already partnership, so they could work in concert and utilize CVPSA in a way without using Barry. You know, the value of the envelope could help their governance structure formalize their contractual relationship. So. I don't necessarily agree with that statement. I think Montpelier could utilize the CVPSA in a way without Barry. Okay. Noted. Thank you. Madam Mayor, I just forgot to mention, I gave two documents to Bill Fraser, our city manager. One of them is a memo that was referred to several times. It was sent to the Barry City Council by their city manager. The other is a 2013 uh, report done by Captain Patch regarding dispatch fees and costs, and I think they would both sh lend significant light to your deliberations. Thank you. I'm sorry, where did we land on meeting together or not? Um, I don't know if we need to meet together again. I think that, I think that there needs to be a, 
And it, you know, it sounds like there's there's a there's a ball in Barry City's court that it's got to clear, and uh, I think we need to I think we need to make that decision before. And and if we make it, it, depending on what that decision looks like, we may not even need to meet again over this discussion mm -hmm. or this topic. Okay. Any other question for Barry? Though? It brought up a topic in regards to if the jail is located in this single site, would that alleviate some of those extra costs? I don't know that answer, but if I don't know what that would entail, but it's obviously more money to fit up and man, but you know, I throw that on the table. I, I don't know if that's even a possibility. I, yeah, I, I think I'd want some. I, I, th I think it's part of the bigger conversation, I guess, and yeah. and. And it definitely is something I'd want to discuss with with Chief Bombardier and and, uh, and other folks in Barry. But beyond that, you know, if yeah, I, I'm I I don't know that I agree with Councillor Putin on the the topic of of a, a video kiosk being sufficient. Well, I didn't bring uh, that up. Barry. I brought up. The no, yeah, no, I understand that. I mean, the the idea of housing, you know, I, I don't know. I, I again, we're talking about. A big shift, which again I think is worth discussing, and yeah. and could eventually lead to a better result. But um, well, it, it brings up our point: we can't answer these decisions, and that was our request. We yeah. can't talk about the jail issue because it's really not dispatch related, and so hmm. it's a policy decision from Barry City in regards to how you view that jail function. And Steve and I have had that conversation, and so mm -hmm. that's why I think part of this is a conversation that Barry City has to have on its own, yeah. mm -hmm. because the lights on or lights off is a, a big topic of conversation. Um, I think part of that too is even if the jail were to go, uh, you're still having the conversation, do we want somebody there 24-7 just in case somebody wants to show up at the police station in an emergency situation. So I, I still think that's a, a, a council level decision for Barry City to make. That makes just sense. The jail option may be uh, beyond uh, our decision making. Uh, if I don't even know whether Central Mount Public Safety Authority would have uh, the capabilities uh, or the authorization at the state level to run a jail. Uh, Tim would probably be better off to answer that, but that was my first sense about uh, a civilian run operation being responsible for a jail. Yep, fair. Thank you. Good point. Um, um, further comment over here? So currently, <laughs> it's housed in there, but we don't have police officers in there really. You have police officers I mean, who are responsible for... Correct. I mean, you would still have the, the police officers that would re be responsible. I mean... I just, that's okay. A, no, no, I'm just... It's an issue that needs further exploring, and I would... Uh, I, I could just see perhaps uh, uh, Chief Bombardier sitting behind me going, no. <laughs> no, actually, I'm doing quite the opposite. Really? Yeah. I was going to say, probably the first step in that is providing you the rules and regulations and the documentation that we provide to the federal government with regards to jail operations. Okay. Um, and there is another comment over here. Yeah, uh, if you would come up to the mic and introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steve McKenzie, Barry City Manager, and I, I just wanted to uh, give some thought to the to, to the council. Is I didn't anticipate either council would be able to make a decision this evening. I think there was a lot of information to digest and that you need some time to digest that. Uh, what my recommendation would be is to put this on the council agenda for uh, the 27th, not next week, but the 27th. Uh, it'll give me time to organize some thoughts and uh, provide some guidance to that meeting, um, uh, as well as to collaborate with the chief. So. Uh, I certainly think a second meeting or another meeting is in order for the Berry Council. Um, I'm just suggesting it not be next week. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, and as a note, we're, we're just having a side conversation because for the next two meetings, we have at least two counselors that will not be present. Oh. So it would most likely be the December 4th meeting that we would probably okay. have that. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Well, so further conversations to be had. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have one other item um, between the two councils here, uh, which was about uh, a recent trip that. Oh, sorry. Can we take a break? Are you setting yeah. up the PowerPoint? Sure. Absolutely. Let's take a five minute break. Well, okay. Hi, Mr. Are you are you ready over there? Oh, we're 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 on. We're live. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, so we're going to uh, come back from our break. And so we have one further item together to, uh, to uh, talk about, um, which has to do with a, a tr uh, actually a discussion that Mary Herring and I have been uh, having for a, a little while now and actually led us to uh, take a trip to Brattleboro uh, just a couple weeks ago and check out their facility uh, where um, Brattleboro has uh, works with uh, the Wyndham County uh, Solid Waste District to have curbside uh, trash recycling and compost. And that is very interesting. And do you want to uh, say anything about Sure. That so, experience? I mean, what kind of leads up to this conversation is we do have the composting law that is coming into effect. Uh, that is a law that has been kicked down the road once before. We don't know if they'll be kicking it down once again. Uh, but either way, it's something that we do have to look forward to uh, addressing. And, and no matter if it's Montpelier or Barry City, it's, it's something that's going to affect all of us. Uh, part of the conversation when we went down there was uh, the economies of scale. So Brattleboro, even though it's, they're just a, uh, a select board that oversees them, they have 12,000 residents versus, uh, you know, in both uh, Barrie and, and Montpelier, where we're below 10,000 residents in each of our municipalities. But there is an ability to have that economy of scale if we wanted to go and uh, look into some of these services together. So if you think about it right now, we have uh, a Casella or a Myers or another vendor that's coming around and, and picking up the solid waste and the recycle. Um, compost is something that, you know, may or may not be uh, popping up in our neighborhoods right now. Uh, so if this is something that we're going to be looking forward to as a law that we have to comply with, it would make sense that we address this in one way or another. Uh, and, and this is what the, led to the viewing of the Wyndham Solid Waste Management District area. Uh, what they've actually showed us is that they make a profit on the composting side of the house because of the way that they work with their partners. Uh, they're able to sell the soil that is created from the composting. So um, we took a bunch of pictures while we were there. Uh, it was a really good experience, but we wanted to make sure that we reached out to all of the council members to see if this is something that we want to address as uh, a group. Uh, and just to to add um, a little bit to that, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, as we move forward, I mean, it might be the kind of thing that we either look into now or it could be something that we look into as a council goal for next year. Um, but, you know, just in terms of the benefits, uh, you know, it seems pretty uh, clear that um, uh, access to composting is not an equitable um, thing in Montpelier or probably anywhere. Uh, and one of the interesting pieces of information that we learned on our trip was that uh, there was about uh, 12 pounds of compost per household per week. And uh, if you were going to compost on your own, uh, then you probably would not be composting meats and cheeses and um, that kind of thing. Um, and that uh, constitutes something like uh, eight pounds. And so you are actually able to compost more. And the facility that they used um, could actually also additionally take uh, cardboard and paper. Um, and in fact, they also even took like, um, uh, gosh, I want to call them like uh, soy milk uh, containers you know, that have a very thin lining of plastic. Um, Sorry? Tetra pack. Tetra pack. Tetra pack. That, that's what it's called? OK. So um, thank you. Uh, anyway, so they, they take that as well. Uh, and the, the product is not uh, organic at the end, um, but it is still uh, viable compost. Um, so anyway, there's, there's a lot of uh, pieces here. And um, anyway, just curious for thoughts and interest. As yeah, you're, as you're saying. Just a couple more notes um, before we entertain some questions. So just think about it with pizza boxes, right? If you try to recycle your pizza box now, you can't. That ends up in the trash. But if you were able to compost, uh, this is usually an item that you can compost because it has that food material on it. It's usually a cardboard box, and it's something that you could turn into a usable product afterward. Um, the uh, residual effects with this, too, is r right now, say there is a Myers and a, a Casella, and they're driving on each of your back streets. They have different schedules, they're, you know, the beeping of the vehicles, which can be a nuisance, but the wear and tear on the roads because of these big haulers that are, are traveling down our, our side streets and in our neighborhoods. 
by having a uh, agreement where possibly we could have uh, one vendor coming down the street on a certain day, you're alleviating that traffic, you're leaving the wear and tear cr uh, created by those vehicles, and you're providing that extra service that could be uh, the curbside uh, composting. And these are just some of the, the concepts. Um, they did have some barriers that they presented as well, one of which is the wood chips as a commodity. Um, right now, they have a, a agreement so that they can actually mix the material with uh, a vendor that is giving away that product for free for them. Uh, around here, we don't know if we have that kind of partner to do that type of work with. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll find out more about that as, as we move forward. Um, the other piece is the um, compact posting at home. We found out in Barry City Charter, uh, in our ordinance, excuse me, that the language is actually prohibitive to have uh, your waste on your lawn. It's actually stated that you can't put it there. Uh, so we were looking into changing the current ordinance that's in place so that if somebody does want to do that home composting, they can. But at the same time, you're usually not putting in your meat and bones into that compost. It's something that attracts nuisance animals. So this would be another way that you could take those items for composting and put them into an area where uh, you won't create more of a nuisance. So with that, I'll turn this over for questions and comment. Councilor Higby. Yeah, if you could um, describe the model a little bit more. Was the district a municipal resource, a business opportunity, or was it a nonprofit? And are there other models that fit into, let's say, a nonprofit uh, mode of operation? Because that could be especially attractive. So this was run by the Wyndham Solid Waste District. And actually, I'm going to ask Ellen. Ellen, do you mind coming up to the table here? So Ellen is the uh, Montpelier rep for uh, the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District. Um, so welcome. Uh, so do you happen to know if uh, waste management districts are nonprofits? Or I mean, there's municipalities. Sorry, what do you mean? We're oh, the municipalities, we're right. We're municipalities, OK, yeah. yep. yep. I'm not sure if that answers your question. It does. So. It, it sets up certain yeah. barriers. Yeah, certain, certain regulations and barriers. And, yeah. yep. So I, I was just trying to get a, a sense of what this, are there some examples like the one that you examined that fit into the nonprofit description? So what we were provided was the information from that district. So it was the PowerPoint uh, that I forwarded on with the RFP process. Okay, and I understand. I, I was just wondering how far you took the examination. And it, it sounds, we're at a preliminary step. Yes. And okay, now I know more. <laughs> so okay, the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District would not take this on. That's um, mm -hmm. we uh, have a broad uh, number of towns that are members, and uh, this would be something that would be run by the cities, and not by the Solid Waste Management District. And I, uh, if the City Council would like to hear more about why that would be and uh, what the Solid Waste Management District, uh, how they would see it, they should have our Executive Director, Bruce Westcott, come. And he can talk about the technicalities of it. But this would not be something, that, this would be something that the cities would uh, put out RFPs for. This would, we as a Solid Waste Management District would um, help facilitate but it would not be something in our purview that we could do. Mm -hmm. So just to elaborate a little bit more on that, one of the possibilities is that um, we could end up contracting with um, uh, either a local hauler and or uh, a local um, uh, place that can take the, the compost. So <clears throat> or what will become compost, <laughs> the, the waste. Um, and uh, yeah, either we can do that through um, just our own municipalities, or we could do that you know, through the um, you know, Central Vermont Solid Waste District. Uh, but right, you know, there, there are people that may be able to do this for us that, that we could contract with. Right, that you could, you could contract with, and we would help, we could help manage. I mean, there's lots of different ways this can be seen. Uh, the, the city can manage it itself. The solid waste district can be a partnership with it. But we can't roll it, uh, run it solely uh, and s uh, sort of serve the communities. Um, but again, Bruce Westcott would be much better at answering the technical questions behind that. Sure. Thank you. Councillor? Yeah, so I, I think preliminarily yeah, it's worth worth exploring. Yeah, just keep it simple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think John had a... Um, first, I want to uh, follow up on, on uh, your mention uh, that it's not a, a doable thing for uh, Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District and that there is uh, there, there are some reasons why, and I think that would be a valuable presentation at some point in the future. Yeah. 
and um, your offer to be of um, informational and tactical uh, tactical assistance in approaching this is uh, certainly a, a welcome offer. And finally, the the concept of having um, curbside citywide curbside for uh, waste recyclables and composting is horribly overdue. Um, I have um, uh, I was kind of shocked to to discover how many people when I brought up this concept. I had a neighbor who moved to next door who moved from um, Maryland. Said, "What is it with these towns in Vermont? You don't have." You know, it, it's not like you're out in uh, the plains of North Dakota. These towns are close together. What's the problem? Where's your municipal pickup? And so I started mentioning this to, to other people. And they said, oh, funny, you should mention that. I, I, I've sort of thought it. So it's the sort of thing that is certainly overdue and people are asking about. Mm -hmm. And it, it's time to dig into this further. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah. and then Rosie. Yeah. No, just one of the top issues I hear from constituents, I think. Why don't we have compost in Montpelier? Uh, and why is it not equitable? Exactly what you're saying here. I'm a knucklehead on this stuff. Um, but I worry, like, if we put in our council goal for, like, a year from now, it's going to take a bloody eternity to get anything <laughs> rolling here. So if we're going to do it, like, let's set up a committee with the two councils and get some, like, get some numbers on the table, see how we move forward on it. Uh, Rosie. So I'm actually strongly opposed to this for Montpelier, and I've let the mayor know this already. Um, Montpelier is a different city than Barrie, and this may very well make sense for, for Barrie City, but Montpelier has a large rural part of the city, and we forget that all the time. But we, you know, we've got this lovely downtown that's very dense, but then we have a, a suburban and frankly rural part of the city as well and I live in that part of the city and I have lived in the, the denser part of the city so I've experienced different types of handling your trash and out in the rural part of the city it would be prohibitively expensive for me to get trash pickup um, I, I could I certainly could um, but I've decided it's not worth it to me so what I do is I have space in the rural part of the city to uh, keep a tote of, of my recycling and my trash and I go to one of the many trash drop-offs around the region once every six weeks or so and I pay about five dollars and that is what I pay versus friends in the denser downtown who I think pay maybe thirty or forty dollars maybe fifty dollars a month to get pickup for them getting pickup is convenient it's you know it's worth it to pay that money for me it's not worth it and I love that I have the choice to decide how much money to spend. I really don't like the idea that the city is going to choose for me that they want me to get this service that's going to cost me as a taxpayer and everybody else a lot more money because I'm way out in the rural part of the city where it doesn't make sense for um, a contractor to serve me. I also feel like we don't have a broken system right now with regard to trash pickup. We have competition. We've got multiple companies that serve our area. We have competition for compost as well. I'm very concerned about the idea that Montpelier would become an entity that would make money selling compost and then become in competition with one of our own local businesses, Vermont Compost, located in Montpelier. You know, it, I, they're doing, the private sector is doing this. Why would we get in on that? Um, and there are a lot of small businesses that do um, act as the, the drops around the region. And why would we put those folks out of business to take on something that I, frankly, I've never been contacted by a constituent asking me why the city doesn't provide the service. Um, so uh, it seems to me that, that the compost pickup and trash pickup would go hand in hand. And I don't particularly have a problem with Montpelier providing a central compost drop-off or, or something like that. I think that would certainly be worth investigating. But I'm very much against us taking on a, a new city service that folks haven't been asking for in, with regards to trash hauling um, that would put other local businesses out of business and that would cost our residents more than we need to. You know, we, we've got this kind of calibration right now where people can decide what level of service is right for them. And if the city makes that decision on their behalf, all of us are going to be paying more. Um, finally, I'm confused by this, this assertion that we need to 
be responsible for composting. Act 148 requires that the haulers be responsible for it. And I know there's some concern that maybe the legislature would, would push that back or put that on somebody else, but right now they haven't. It's on the haulers to do it. So if somebody has Myers or Casella, Act 148 requires that those entities would provide compost pickup in the next couple years. Um, so I don't see why we're rushing to do this when it's already been provided for in state law. If at some point that changes, then sure we can look at it, but I don't, I don't get why we're doing this. Um, so that's, that's my piece. That's fair. Thank you. Very fair. Thank you. Other comments? Can I, d I just want to make some clarifications and just answer some questions. Uh, the way that, when I say that the, the Solid Waste Management District wouldn't run this, is the city has to write an ordinance and the city would, would regulate which hauler or haulers are contracted with the city and uh, there would be um, rules around that. And so that's what I mean by the management of it, that the Solid Waste Management District would not those laws that you have in ordinances would be written by the city and not by us. Um, so that's his, his clarification on management. And, uh, you know, this, has, this discussion has come up in the solid waste management districts throughout the state of having uh, centralized uh, trash and recycling pickup and now adding the composting. And Rosie is absolutely right that uh, the reason it hasn't moved forward sooner is because there's a large rural areas that have no reason to pay for this and they can compost themselves. That said, there are ways to um, write in for the rural members you know, around the composting that they can opt out if they can show that they have composting on uh, safe composting or sanitary composting or however you want to word it on their own property. Um, this is a model that's used throughout the country as composting is becoming more and more of a thing uh, and is more regulated by the states than it used to be because we have too much garbage and we have nowhere to put it. The other thing is um, a lot of cities are doing this for environmental reasons because there's, uh, you have a lot more traffic, a lot less traffic on your roads when you contract with one hauler. And one hauler going to one site to pick up and deliver garbage and recycling. So as the, the mayor was saying, that we'll have less traffic and less wear and tear on the road. So that's one of the pros. And of course, but the con, as uh, Rosie was saying, are that there is a cost, whether you put it into the tax base or whether you put it into a city fee, however you, want, you would write it in, there is a cost. So people who already have haulers, the cost would likely go down, but people like Rosie, the cost would go up. So there's a lot of discussion around that. There, there are lots of models to look at. There's lots of um, cities that you could ask for ordinances from that already have this in place across the country. It can be very effective. It can ultimately uh, be much more efficient uh, for the entire trash system. And, you know, the thing about the composting, we, much like contracting with a hauler, you could uh, contract with a composter. So there's Grow in Moortown, and uh, there's Carl here, and you could contract with them. They would have to meet minimum requirements uh, for taking on that amount of compost. The taking on city of Montpelier and the city of Barry's compost at once is a huge, huge amount of compost. Uh, Bruce could probably get into exact numbers, but you would need a very professional composter. Uh, to have a facility like they do in um, Wyndham County is extraordinary. That's, uh, it's a unique facility. We don't have anything like that up here that can compost things like plastic bags and cardboard. And the plastic bag, the compostable plastic bag issue, it doesn't work really well anyway. And they've run into a lot of problems with that. Uh, and that's one of the reasons they give away the wood chips for free is because they're contaminated. Um, so there's a lot 
of issues to consider with this, and uh, it wouldn't be financially feasible for the city of Montpelier to create a composting facility, and it does make sense if you do go that route that you would contract with someone who could handle it. Just for clarification. Councilor LePage. Um, I, I appreciate the, 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 the take on um, the reality of a lot of moving parts uh, to um, engage in something like this. and. Um, uh, addressing the concept expressed about the rural nature of, of some people um, as opposed to uh, people in a city, um, it's really one of those things in my mind that could be looked at as is this broader than on an individual situation? Is there a, a public need? And uh, it's the case that we have uh, public schools that we're all paying for, and not all of us send our children there. Uh, now, I'm not a raging socialist, um, but I'm also not um, a, a right-winger that says, uh, or a libertarian that says, uh, if I ain't buying it, I got no part of it. Um, so perhaps uh, the discussion has to be um, a little bit of uh, afforded, uh, is this a public need? Um, and that I don't expect to be settled right now uh, at this moment but it's certainly a concept, a way of looking at the concept um, uh, in the context of it's not a different approach than we have had for other things like road maintenance and schools and, uh, and libraries that not all of us use, but we all support. Great, thank you. Uh, so one uh, possibility that uh, Mary Herring and I had discussed was um, looking into uh, just getting some more information from uh, potential uh, companies that might be involved uh, and I mean the the thought was put out there like what if we had a committee I mean we could wait until you know the next <laughs> uh, um, you know next session basically to see if uh, we want to make this a council goal but I mean if there's if there's interest um, in forming a committee, uh, either collectively or separately, either way, whatever, but, um, and then just looking into getting more information, you know, just not committing yourselves to anything, but finding out, you know, how much might it increase uh, some people's costs or how much might it lower other people's costs. Um, I don't know, what do, you, what do you think? Is that, is that of value to you? Is that the, something people are interested in? The, the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District would happily assist with that process. Yeah, go ahead. I'm never going to come out and say, don't get more information. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that uh, it's, I would need to be shown that this is better than what we have now. Um, I'm kind of like Rosie, although I've never lived more than a mile away from City Hall, and yet I've never had garbage pickup. I've always uh, driven it, driven my own garbage, and we uh, we do composting uh, in our yard when uh, I remember to carry it out from the kitchen to the composting bin. Um, so I don't know. I, I would need to be shown that it's this is better than uh, the present. Okay, um, Rosie. I want to caution, I don't feel like without setting this as a council goal, I want to dedicate any staff time to this. So if this is something, you know, if we're going to, if you're taking this on to work with, um, with the uh, district, Central Vermont Solid Waste District, um, directly, sure, <laughs> more information is always good. But I do not want to spend staff time um, researching this uh, because we have not set it as a priority and have not evaluated it against our other needs. That seems fair. Other thoughts? Yeah, Donna. I, I'm in favor of a committee, and I do think it goes under headings, but tonight with my head, I couldn't tell you which one. Can, can you speak into your mic, Donna? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. thank you. Uh, I do think we need to look at it, and I do think that within our goals, don't ask me to ask specific which goal, but that under the whole healthy living and climate, it, it's all in there. And the one thing I think it would do is 
I know most of my neighbors still put all their food in their trash. And I know they'll keep doing it. And that's one reason I supported the clear plastic bag, because we nothing helps us than to be embarrassed in front of our peers. <laughs> and so really, and t until we get enough conversation going in the community, and as well as educating ourselves, I think it has a lot of good rippling effects. So I would support a committee. Okay. To add to that, um, the Solid Waste Management District could work towards helping to find a grant to pay for a study. So that's a possibility as well. Cool. I'd like to be the first from the Barry City Council to say I'd be part of that committee. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. And Connor, I, I think I heard you say that for Montpelier as well. No, I'm out. <laughs> you, should, you can never. You, should, you, you, you know Connor. when you actually hear Connor say something. <laughs> Any other thoughts? I'm not sure that I've heard enough from Montpelier. Wait, are we, are we forming a committee? Are we not? What do you think, team? Uh, I'd be in favor of forming a committee. Okay. Yes. I, th I think without a, some kind of a vote, it sounds like uh, gathering more information is, is in order. So um, do you want to do this jointly? I mean, might as well. We can, and uh, I think it's not one for that properly for this meeting. <laughs> so we're going to have to do that at another meeting, but at least we have the interest that's shown. We have a partner that said that they might be able to work with us for grant funding for a possible feasibility study, um, and we can okay. go forward from there. Great. So we'll put something on a future agenda item to formalize that. Yes. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, and with that, if you do not need City Council nope. from Barry anymore. No. Nope. So I'll make a motion that the Barry City Council Second. adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed aye. nay. Great. No nays. Well, it's thank 920. You. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank, thank you for coming to the round table. I just want to mention how honored I am to be here in this group. People that most of them I've never met before. And I am so honored to have done so. Great. I, I'll, I'll say the opposite. I've met all, almost all of them. Yeah, We're okay. We can go back. <laughs> this was pretty easy. So. Great. Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Well, I'll be back. <laughs> it's a hell of a crossover show, guys. Uh, what do you say up for this? What do you mean? Yeah. You enjoy it, like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a rush, so I guess we should just do it. Yeah. What time yeah. do you do the like, Magneto's thing? I don't know. Uh, if so, team, yeah. team Montpelier is still here. Yeah. Montpelier is still here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're just transitioning. Right. We're not done. We're not done. Come on. Thank you so much. Are you Alan's brother? No, he's my brother, because then I can own him. I'm going to move over. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. So we have a presentation, I think. Yeah, uh, if you just give me just a second. Yeah, I really for sure. don't want to take more than a few minutes. Okay. I just I mentioned this a while ago as you all have no idea what the election trends are, what's what's going on. I feel like I do everything in the dark. So I just thought I'd just give you all some numbers to give you a picture of what's going on with elections here. Um, All right, let's see what we can do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, you can open? You better run for me here. Start that. Tom, thanks for volunteering. Hey. We have a better committee. All right, we can do it this way. Interestingly enough, it's not letting me go. You know what? I think. Did you turn that back on? Oh well, I'm not saying it's not letting me go full screen on this, anyways. But I turned it off, forgetting that there was a one coming or something. This, one? this is a property one. This is elections. Oh. Report on elections. Yeah. You do the property well, one while he's setting up. It was such a small oh, there's a property one too. Too. Well, he the consent agenda item. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is it off? Yeah. That's good. All right. Yeah, there we go. Oh, I see. It's got a different display down here. Cool. Great. All right. 
So I just want to give you a quick snapshot of election trends yeah. and w where we're at. Um, just like there's a note up there for each slide. Turnout, early vote, the election day registration that is that is new, the automatic voter registration that's new, and just a sense of, of security here. Um, all right, so this, oh boy, that's hard to see. Um, let me try to explain what this is. I thought it would be clearer than that. Uh, just did this a few hours ago. So this is a look at turnout by election type over the years. You see each little line coming down is 1,000 votes. And what I have them is, it's a lot of information at once, but it's to visually give you a sense of how these, these elections tend to clump in terms of turnout. If you look at the bottom where we have so many, it's because every year we have a city meeting. So that gives you a sense of where the city meeting turnouts tend to be. They tend to clump around the low 2000s, and there's that one outlier that spikes into 3000. And that was actually the uh, city meeting that we had with that was parallel with the, the presidential primary. Um, up higher, you see the general elections um, tend, to, you know, tend to be the big ones. Obviously, general elections on a presidential year are higher sustained, but you see that one up on top, that general election, non-presidential election, you're right on top. That's the one we just had. And it's right there comparable. It's, it's, it's right there behind the last time we had a general election in a presidential election year. Now the presidential primaries, um, see we have that spike from when, when Bernie was involved, the one, and that's gonna match down below. But notice the August primary here. Yeah. Those are in the past, those have been tiny, teeny, teeny, teeny. There's that little one there that's something like 600 people. And now that most recent one is the dark one. They are spiking now. They are spiking to as much or more than city meeting turnout. So people have discovered those, and that's why that was such a crush this last time. But anyways, this is data going back basically since I've been here. So just to give you a sense of where the trends are. The trends are going city meeting, getting a little more consistently in the higher zone, but staying in that zone. August primary is going through the roof, and our general elections, whether they're presidential or non-presidential, starting to even out at a very high end. Um, early voting. This is going back over the years. Uh, it's, this was actually surprised me to see. We, our big spike on early voting was the 2016 general election, where it was actually higher than this we, we, we experienced here. It was roughly in the low 40% of our total turnout was early vote. And it was more like 37% this time. Part of the reason, or the reason then, that this general election was so much harder to handle than the, um, than the one two years ago was that we had it concurrent, we had two elections going on. We had the special city election too. The ballots were done at different times, the legal, requirements, the legal deadlines were different, so we were running that in parallel, but it was very, very close. And you can see if this trend, we, we don't have a solid early vote trend yet. It's all over the map, and it's still mostly low. So we can get those numbers to, to stay where the general election takes them, then we're going to completely change the way we do elections around here. John, mm -hmm. not an interesting take on that stat, these are, are raw numbers would be to look at what those were as percentage of the total vote cast to see how, see how if we're more consistent because the, the, the total votes go up and down too. Right. So, Well, I can give you a little bit of that. The reason why you're not seeing um, I mean, some of that information is because of the dynamics of the voter checklist. Um, you know, we have, depending on when you look at the voter checklist, well, let me just tell you, like right now, uh, if you just looked at raw registration names on the voter checklist, it's going to tell you about 7,400. Oh, and the, election, and the, the city has about 7,800. Now, you factor out the challenged voters, that brings you down to about 6,200. Every two years when we run a real comprehensive challenge process, it brings it down to around 5,600, which is more correct. So some of these percentages, if you look at them just as percentages, they can be deceptive. I actually just meant a percentage of the total vote cast. Total vote cast, well, if you see the high, the 2016, the percentage of the total vote cast there is about 42% compared to about 37% of right. the 2018. My point was, mm -hmm. some of the years we have lower total votes, we also had lower total vote cast. So the, what's the percentage of early voting 
Oh, I hear what you're saying. Um, it, I, maybe we can talk about tomorrow. It's not that urgent. Okay. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah, I should have had that number up there. You're absolutely right. That is more interesting. Okay. <laughs> Um, election day voting registration trends. And this, another quick one, it's easy. This has only been in place for these last few elections here, you see. Um, the special city meeting where it first became active, we had virtually none. And as word gets out, we've gotten up, we've had 40 or so roughly election day registrations the last couple of elections until boom, this time around, uh, we got, we were, we were ready to absorb it for the most part, although that's where there were lines on election day, is when people were, um, were looking to get registered. And we kept them running through for the most part, but that's, that's changing everything right there. To, to, uh, I mean, there's a lot of ways it's a much more efficient system, and I love it. I lobbied for it hard, but, but it's definitely changing our workload. So it's, is, does that basically end up replacing provisional ballots? Like, we don't have provisional ballots anymore because people are able to register that day? Well, it, it's the final nail in the coffin, provisional ballots. Um, provisional ballots had already been virtually eliminated, and that's because, um, well, first of all, we're, we're very, you know, the benefit of the doubt goes to the voter in Vermont more than most states. But also, to the extent there was a problem, it would generally be around, for example, the DMV, somebody registering, they're not getting their name in, and then they show up and they say, I did everything right, I did everything I was supposed to, I should get to vote, and they would be deferred to. You, you have an affidavit they could sign which basically said, I did everything I should have, I did everything right, give me a ballot, and then we'd give them a ballot. So those provisional ballots had already been largely eliminated by that process. So that right now, there's still in law, but we only give people provisional ballots if it's somebody like Will Senning says when he does training, the election director, if somebody comes in, you know, completely drunk from Charlie O's and is belligerent and is demanding you give him a ballot and you don't think they should get a ballot, give him a provisional ballot. <laughs> Just mark on the ballot, <laughs> I don't think this one should count. Um, but that's it. We just don't use them anymore. And it's a real point of pride with Vermont, actually, that we don't. There was a role for them in the past. And now you see the more progressive states, they're, they're, going, they're going the way of all things here. Um, what else we got here? Now, local land impacts of, of um, automatic voter registration. I find this interesting. This is, this, is, this is my environmental slide, okay? You can start to see, and this is just in Montpelier. Um, this is, let's see, this is a slide I had. I didn't go over this one too well because I had this for another presentation. But you can see where you have new voter registrations over the last few years. And they start to come back up and they start to split their 2013. Uh, the paper registrations start to peel away. And uh, that's when the online voter registration system started. And then here in the last couple of years, as we've had automatic voter registration, where you just go and you get your license, you have to opt out or you're automatically registered. Boom, our registrations have gone up and our paper registrations have actually started coming down. So uh, it's increasing registration and it's also decreasing paper and it cleans up our lists at an incredible rate. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And ever since they've had that, the quality of our list, the number of duplications, the, 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 the correct address information, correct date of birth information has just been improving dramatically. And I love it. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Sure. We were finding a lot of the same names, but maybe the initial was different. Hey, mm -hmm. Donna, can you speak into your mic? We were finding uh, a lot of the same names twice, mm -hmm. you know, and just be the initial difference, it'd be the same address, the first one looked down, or the name and Marie would be together, and in one place it was apart. Mm -hmm. We thought it came because of that. Because no, they, that's cleaning them up. Because they didn't, they said, oh, I, read, I renewed, but I didn't mark it. I didn't realize I had to mark it. Well, there were several of them that we noted, and I hope you... If you mark it... You, you opt out. The op right, they didn't mark it. Okay. So they were already registered and they came through twice. Mm -hmm. But because the initial was different, they appeared on our list twice. Well, if the initial's different, then yeah, they're, they're going to get on a second time. And, and I'm certainly going to be reticent to, to tag them because you do get people with the same names with different initials. So that's tough. That, that becomes then a process for when we go over to the Board of Civil Authority with a fine tooth comb. To, to really look at those we, we must manually. Have had, we had at least a dozen of them, I would say, during the I'm, I'm not surprised. 
Well, there's, I'm sure there's at least two dozen of them. Okay. Just, um, I've never had that many. It just was everything. The address was the same, except some difference, either initial or the first and middle name were put together. But it was, and it didn't happen before. This was the first time it happened to them. Oh, it's always been like that, for sure. Okay. That's, that's, that is a perennial problem I have with the lists. There's definitely. Is there a way to get that cleaned up? Just more looking at it, more practice. It's we come around. We can't. We don't make wholesale adjustments of the list when a lot of these mistakes start to crop up, which is during this dense election season, where from one year to another you have four elections or more, and then we look at them as a group, as a board of civil authority. Then after this is over, because you got to have full 90 days before you make any kind of purges or challenges. Um, so that's why we usually wait then in one of these cycles until after the last election, which is going to be the March okay. so when town we meeting. So when that person tell us which one is the official one, mm -hmm. and we mark the wrong one out, are you ever going back to look at that one? Yes. Okay. It just seems that it's just continuous. Okay. It, it is, and it will be. Okay. But the times we can make big leaps on that are in these off years where we sit down and we go over them. Okay. Now for accessibility, we got the new machines. We had one person use them. <laughs> it didn't go very well. They weren't happy with me. Um, but once we get the hang of these things, uh, these are our new accessible machines. They um, can be used by anybody, and they produce a ballot that's, that's, that's then run through the machine. But they, they're a one-stop shop doing everything. They have audio. They have headphones. You can use a touch screen. There's an eight key navigation pad or three button switches, depending on whether you're, you know, visually, you know, you have audio impairment, um, you know, mobility issues. They're neat things, although right now they confuse the bejesus out of me, but um, we will get the hang of them and they are there and they are very cool. John, I heard a, a news article about um, translation um, and how we're not really prepared as a state to offer translation services when it comes to voting. And the Secretary of State's office hoping that maybe these could be used for that. Do you know anything more about that, or is there potential for that? I don't. I mean, it's something we've talked about. I've had the conversation with staff here over the last few years. Um, you know, and we've talked about our own election reforms, which, which we've done, you know, do, writing in the right to have a, a ballot in the, you know, the language that you're most comfortable in. Um, it's something that came up when we've had international observers. Uh, it's one of the only ways we, you know, they, they've given, you know, give me that little sign, shaking their head when I've said, no, there isn't a, <laughs> there isn't a ballot. Um, I'm not sure what the Secretary of State's office is referring to, other than it's, it's programmable, so you could pre presumably program anything you wanted into it. I think the idea was that uh, while doing that translation is beyond the means of towns that probably don't have people who speak a lot of different languages, having this be a central uh, resource would enable that need to be met, even if you're the only person who speaks uh, your language in your town. I think, I haven't heard this, but that would fit into with my sense that they would, I think at some point, like to see these more broadly deployed for use, not just by, for accessibility purposes, but by everyone else. And so that would, that would be consistent with that. We'll see if that happens. I don't know. I'm not sure if there's the clerks feel about them yet. I guess, oh, sorry. Oh, no. I would just, I would like to see us do everything possible to provide ballots in other languages. And so if this is an option that we can pursue either as a city or as a, you know, a, a, a constituent of the state, um, I, I would like us to do that. I'd be for hardwiring it into our charter, honestly. I mean, I, I almost made that suggestion a couple years ago. I feel pretty strongly about it, too. I mean, I don't know what I would do if somebody... The one time that we had an issue like that, um, fortunately had a Spanish speaker around who was helpful. But I mean, I guess worst case scenario, if somebody were in that situation, I'd be hitting Google Translate and bringing them something, <laughs> which wouldn't be very good, but maybe better than nothing. But I do think folks have a right to that expectation. I also just want to ask, um, you said that the one time that it got used this past election, it didn't go all that well. But that was more uh, 
because of the situation than because of the technology? No, it was because it was brand new to us. Yeah. And we, so, our first run, it was like, where's the power button, that kind right, of thing. Right, okay. So with, <laughs> with a little more experience, you're confident that yeah. this should be able to... Oh, yeah, it's a great okay. machine. Good. It's a great system. Okay. I got no, no complaints about the system at all. It's a good one. Um, so, yeah, last thing I would mention, just security, um, just to think in terms of, this is something I talk a lot about, I talk about to an extent around the country. I write on it. Um, you know, there's three points, and this also gives me a chance to tell you a couple things that are just bouncing around my office right now. You know, you can look at the three point attentions here where there's potential security issues. There's here locally, uh, there's the Secretary of State's office where they have the statewide checklist that we're all working into and where they, they collect those results, and then there's the handshake in between. Um, right now, you know, the quick and dirty way to think of those things and, and, and what's going on. You've got the Secretary of State who's really hardened the online, the access to the online voter system, um, the, the hosting of the voter lists. Could he do more? Yes. Um, but he's done an awful lot. We've instituted two-factor authentication for any of us who want to even access the system, even as clerks. We have to put in our password and then get sent a text with a secondary password to enter it to get access done a terrific job. Locally, uh, you know, we're trying to steer away from, you know, the obvious low-hanging fruit like, uh, you know, wireless networks and such. At the local level, we're always going to be very vulnerable to, you know, phishing attacks, social engineering. We're only going to be as, as, as secure as our least secure user and as secure as our local network. We do pretty well in Montpelier. We are all on one system. I'm not necessarily totally sanguine about how good we're doing across the, across the state. Now, as far as the handshake goes, you know, that's where you get into cryptography, stuff like that, the communication from here to there. We're not doing a lot of that, but I've been approached by a, um, a company, actually, I guess they're a Swiss company called Guard Time, which is promoting their own private blockchain that they want to use as sort of to be the the, the ether in between the local site and the, the final administrative site. And they approached me about doing a, having us join one of their, their pilot programs in March. And I'm all for it. I think we're going to give it a shot. They're doing pilot programs in Orange County um, as well. And they just wanted to demonstrate how this would work at a smaller level. So once that crystallizes a little more, we'd have to get the Jim to give us, you know, access to be able to work one-on-one -on -one with the vendor of the statewide checklist, but that may move in the next two or three weeks, so that could be happening. Um, also, with the local level, right now I'm talking with uh, uh, Noah Prates, who's the, the head of elections at Cook County, Illinois, and the uh, head of the Cyber Policy Institute at the University of Chicago, and we're talking about creating a... Uh, Certi certification standard for users and for network admins of election systems at the local level that could be a way to start educating and tightening up that system. So you might be hearing about that some more soon, too, depending on how that conversation goes. But, but yes, that's a snapshot of what our elections look like and what we're talking about in the office. Cool. Okay. All right. Thanks, y'all. I think I think we can probably turn the lights back on. Oh yeah. And uh, <laughs> I think we're just about to. We have that one. Um, oh, uh, oh, that property. Uh, item D. Yes, thank you. John, do you want to talk about item D? Jack. Uh, John. Jack. Jack. He's a John. <laughs> Whoever you are. <laughs> um, well, the first question that occurred to me when I saw it was whether this should be. Uh, it's it's a possible settlement approval of a possible settlement of a property tax assessment appeal <coughs> and the first question that occurred to me was whether it should be in executive session because it relates to pending litigation to which the public body is is a party um, I think the uh, the thinking with this was it's, it's it's yes it's litigation it's it's an appeal hearing um, and this was basically a proposed settlement it isn't going to sway the appeal hearing one way or the other it doesn't weaken our position the fact that we're considering it when we accept this or, or we don't um, so we did talk about that and had no issue with 
just putting it on this way, it didn't seem like. Okay. Um, I didn't see anything but the one page thing that says there's a possible settlement. Is there more than that that we should have gotten? Or I don't think so. Uh, the assessor draft drafted this up. Basically, as I understand it, they were there was an appeal. The Board of Civil Authority made a decision. It was appealed to the state and has been taking forever. And so it was sort of, is there anything we can do when they reached an agreement? And because it's, it is an appeal that only the city council can settle them. I think so our choices are we take the, this or we just let it go through the appeal process. Oh, if it went to the BCA, Jack, then did it did, and I, I it was uh, it was that property up uh, off Town Hill Road, um, at the end of the road, and the guy has a very fancy uh, garage in which he keeps antique cars. But that really didn't enter into the appeal because I think the the property owner and the uh, assessor came to an agreement on on that part of it. But I was on the committee uh, that viewed that uh, property, and I'm pretty sure that I'm the person who actually wrote, uh, wrote the decision. And I meant to go back and look it up to see what we, we said about it. But uh, I, I, I think we probably denied the appeal, uh, maybe in, in whole, but maybe just in part. And I thought, the reasoning was well founded, of course, since I wrote it. But uh, <laughs> but but before we approve it, I'd just be interested in hearing this was someone Star. tell us. Hmm? This was Star, right? Yeah. There, there, something just came into my office regarding this, like yesterday. Hmm. But I, before we approve it, I would just be interested in having someone explain why the uh, the proposed settlement is in the city's interest as opposed to uh, sticking with the decision the Board of Civil Authority made and uh, see what comes of the appeal. Sure. So we if we could put it on the agenda next, for another next meeting. meeting. and I'll ask Steve to provide more info. Okay, okay. thanks. That sounds great. As a PCA member myself, I'm, I'm right there with you. I didn't realize that that's what that was. So does that mean we need to technically table that mm -hmm. item? Do we need or to whatever. Postpone. Postpone, but we don't need to. Do we need to vote to postpone? Yes. Um, you can. You, you can do it by unanimous consent, like anyone else. Has done. Okay. Any objections to that? Nope. Great. Okay. <laughs> Super. So we're we're gonna postpone that to the next meeting. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. So, council reports. Uh, Glenn, would you like to start? Sure. Um, we'll go out. So, as usual, uh, I'll be at Baguito's tomorrow morning, 8.30 to 9.30. Uh, it's been good every time uh, so far, and I anticipate it should be good going forward. Now that it's gotten cold, I'm also thinking I'd like to start uh, something like weekly walks to, to, to uh, spread my attention a little bit. I find that I, I see all kinds of stuff that I haven't been thinking about at all when I take a walk, um, and it's fun to walk with people. Uh, so no move on that yet, but I think I'd like to start it. Um, I want to mention that uh, volunteering at the election was a ton of fun last week, and thank you, John, and all the other volunteers and residents. Uh, I encourage everyone to volunteer for elections. It's great. Uh, and I was recently at the T.W. Wood Gallery, as um, council member, uh, ex officio member of the board, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's great there, and everyone should also go see the, the Wood Gallery shows. Um, right now there is a, a really impressive show of paintings by Mary McKay Lauer and Elizabeth Nelson, uh, and it's open Tuesday through Saturday, 12 to 4, so go see it. Um, so the, uh, the, the scooters uh, will be flying south um, in the next few days here. Uh, I'll have some analytics to share uh, at the next meeting uh, with the council and Mayor Mai, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <Mayor. laughs> 
But uh, great, great job, everybody, on the election who volunteered. There was a, I, I, I thought it was a really smooth election. Just haven't seen them in the past, and I think it made a uh, world of difference having it upstairs in Lost Nation, even though I know that's a bone of contention sometimes. Uh, just being able to stretch out a bit there, that was great. No, it's never a bone of contention. The only reason why we had it down here is that historically we had, in the other one, we, historically we've had the August primaries down here, mm. and that is history that has now come to a roaring end, I think. <laughs> so they will all be up there from now on. But no, the regular general elections, city meetings, they're always up there. I'd like to <coughs> remind us that way back when I asked was interested in the council doing a self-evaluation, and some of you other expressed support of that, but haven't done anything. So I'm trying to gather some information, and whether it's on the next meeting or the next, but be thinking about it. If you come across anything about self-evaluation of boards, just send it to me, and we'll try to integrate it all and come up with some good questions for ourselves. Um, also, just from the Montpelier Transportation <coughs> Infrastructure Committee, they were a little disappointed not to be uh, talked to about the e-scooters and the parking garage and the rail study, but they realize they also need to make themselves more present to be a better resource for the council and to sort out how much of transportation issues they can help the council with. So I think the council will be hearing more from them. Great. Sure, go ahead. A um, couple things. Um, one is that um, the Kellogg Hubbard Library is having their evening at the library uh, gala on December 1st um, and it's one of their major fundraisers and this year they have a donor they're trying to get younger people uh, involved and they have a donor who is basically willing to split the cost of the gala ticket for people under 40 or in their 40s or under so I guess in your 40s is a, a young young person um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, sign me up so uh, I have information on that or I'm sure you could just call the library and ask them about the information if you are a in your 40s or younger person and interested in still paying to go to the library gala but paying less I guess um, uh, that's that's an option um, and then um, <coughs> I wanted to mention that at a previous meeting where we had discussed um, what we wanted to talk to League of Cities and Towns about um, I had briefly mentioned uh, wishing that um, public meeting law would allow us to have an electronic forum um, where we could kind of hash out some of the details of things um, in a public setting where people could read what the council was posting, so it would be very public, um, but that would be done electronically. So we could do it from home and, you know, as we had time and kind of that would help us shorten our meetings. And I think it would even be more um, accessible to the public because they could see some of our conversations as we're in our thought development as we're thinking about things um, rather than just having to sit through meetings to see what we're thinking about. Um, and so, but current public meeting law, um, I believe, does not allow us to do that. Glenn had expressed interest in us exploring that further, and I was thinking about what we could do to, to change that law to allow us to do that. And I think that um, one of the steps would be for us to send a letter to our delegation um, in the State House and let them know that this is something we might like to pursue, and this is the change that we would need to the law to have that happen. Um, and then potentially forward that on to cities, League of Cities and Towns and ask them to support that. Um, so uh, I would be happy to draft something. Bill had said that you know, he would work with me to help figure out what exactly we would need changed in, in public meeting law to accommodate that if, there's, if this is something that interests folks and if there's support. Um, and of course, we would bring it to a meeting. But uh, before I go draft something, I just wanted to gauge support for that. I'm seeing some nods. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. No, I'm just not a writer. I never did well in chat rooms. It, it's <laughs> painful. It takes too much time. Donna, how about emoji? Can you can you participate? <laughs> <Two emojis. laughs> yeah. Okay. But I understand so, all you writers go for it. So, go ahead and, and draft yes. something, and we'll look at it. Okay. Great. Awesome. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention is the um, Human Rights Campaign Municipal Equity Index Scorecard came out. Um, it's actually a little. It was a month or two ago, but I missed a, a meeting. Um, and Montpelier was scored a 50 out of 100. 
um, which is not great. And I looked at the actual scorecard, um, and there are some areas I've, I've spoken with Bill about where maybe they didn't get the right information. We feel like we've done some good stuff that, that wasn't reflected in the scorecard. Um, but one of the pieces, and so we're going to do some work on that and, and see, you know, do we need to, to do more work in these areas, or is it just some incorrect information that we need to get to them uh, for next year's scorecard? Um, but there is one area, um, uh, leadership's public position on LGBTQ equality. Um, and we scored a four out of five on that. And leadership's uh, pro-equality legislative or policy efforts, we scored a zero out of three on. Um, and that's one where I think we should be getting full marks. Um, and I think, you know, if we haven't been as vocal about our support for these members of our community, um, <coughs> I think we should be more vocal. Um, my initial reaction was, you know, well, I don't need to make a statement in support of, of the LGBTQ community. Like, of course I support them and, and they're full members of our, our they belong here, they're, they're us. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I sat back and thought, well, this is what this community is telling us they need us to do. And maybe it's not obvious that we, we are supportive and welcoming. And um, so I would like us to be thinking about that and thinking about what we can do so that next year we are getting a full, full marks and not a 50 out of 100. Yeah, I wonder if like a resolution, something to that effect. Anyway, we can keep I'll talking about, about it. it. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, just a couple of things. I echo what other people said about the election. I thought it was great to see new people who have not been involved before come out and uh, work on the election and be volunteers, and particularly young people. <coughs> um, I have a number of young friends who are out working on the uh, election on Tuesday, and uh, what I heard was they enjoyed it, and they're going to be back and do it again, and I think that's great. Also, um, we had someone from the uh, Solid Waste Management District here tonight, uh, and while I was listening to the presentation and looking up stuff online, I see this Friday is America Recycles Day, and uh, there's going to be an event over at the uh, Recycling Center in Barrie, including free cider and donuts when you bring additional recycling items. So uh, if people aren't already aware of it, it's uh, online, it's on their Facebook page, and there's always a chance to get donuts. <laughs> OK, well, uh, I just want to thank everybody who came out to vote uh, this past couple of weeks. And um, yeah, just regardless of how you voted on anything. I think uh, just the fact that we had such great turnout is wonderful. And um, there was something else I was going to say. I can't remember. Uh, so yeah, thanks for coming out to vote. Oh, yeah, I remember. Um, yeah, if uh, I've, I, you know, I'm continuing to uh, receive some some emails from people who have continue to have some questions um, about items, and that's fine. Uh, so if you have any questions further about you know where we go from here or um, what happens at this point, please feel free to email. Um, happy to talk talk more about it. That's it for me. Uh, I want to thank everyone for helping out in the election. Everybody was involved, and it was great. And I think we had about th three dozen volunteers move through that day. It was, it, yeah, the day was, huh, I won't say that the days leading up to it were that smooth, but the day <laughs> itself, <laughs> the day itself went really, really well. I felt really, really good about it. So yeah. thank you all so much for that. And then I also want to... Um, uh, thank Glenn for his suggestion that I do the minutes on uh, Google Docs, which should have occurred to me ages ago. And I have, and now all I have to do is put a link that I'm going to post right now, and the minutes as a working product are right there on the <laughs> So anyways, I should have done that ages ago. <laughs> Jeez. Thank you. There we go. Whoa. Very good. Oh, me. Uh, I no, I don't have much of anything that we didn't put in writing for Friday. I've had kind of a crazy week, so um, no, I'm good. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, I don't know if I'm good or not. Actually, I haven't well. really been here much. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. Well, then, without objection, uh, 
we'll consider the meeting adjourned. Super. Maybe you Thank can you. Say